Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Alice Hawks. Viewer discretion is advised. Alice Ann Hawks was born on May 26, 1964, and she was born and raised in Maine. At the time of this case, she is 23 years old and she's dating a man named Stephen Bouchard. The two of them live in an apartment here in this building, which was located in Westbrook, Maine. It was August 4th, 1987. Stephen was coming home to the apartment, but he couldn't get inside because the deadbolt was locked and he didn't have his deadbolt key. He thought this was strange because the deadbolt was never used. The last time Stephen saw Alice was the day prior on October 3rd. That day, he had played some golf with friends, he did some errands, and Alice was going to be at home doing some laundry, which she had to bring down to the laundromat. He came home that later that day and said he couldn't get in, so he just got back into the car with his friends and stayed with them that night. Then he went back the following day, and he ended up having to get the landlord involved to get the door open. When they got inside, they found the body of Alice Hawks. She was found in the bathroom with her throat slit from one end to the other. There was a trail of blood leading from the bathroom to around the front door. Allegedly, there was a deadbolt key found inside the apartment, and there was no forced entry in, like, the windows. The door wasn't kicked in or anything. The windows were all locked, so they don't know how the killer got out and managed to lock the deadbolt. That remains uh, quite a mystery in this. According to some diary entries in the days leading up to her murder, I guess she had been writing about how her and Stephen's relationship was kind of rocky from time to time, but nothing that pointed to like him abusing her or anything along those lines. I know that some people consider his behavior on these couple of days was a little strange. Like, why didn't he call out for her that night when he got back to the apartment. The last person to see her alive was actually her downstairs neighbor who actually ended up helping her carry her duffel bag full of laundry up the flight of stairs. He said that no one else was with her. It was just her. He saw her go into her apartment on her own. And then nobody else saw or heard anything. Nobody saw anyone enter the apartment. No one saw anyone running away. No cars speeding away. Absolutely nothing. Police have in recent years said this is a very solvable case, but they just need the evidence. They have even gone so far as to say they think they know what happened and possibly who did it, but they don't know how to prove it. They've never announced a suspect. They've never announced a person of interest, including the boyfriend. And it sounds like they are still relying on the public's help for any information. If you have any information about the murder of Alex Hawks, please call 800-228-0857. A man goes missing in 2004. Three years later, his wife vanishes. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Beverly McBride. Viewer discretion is advised. Beverly K. McBride was born on July 17, 1959, and she was born in Galveston, Texas. She was a 1978 graduate of Silsby High School, and for the past eight years leading up into the moment she disappeared, she was working at the Mark Stiles Correctional Facility. She was a correctional officer there. Now, there is very little information about either of these cases here. But according to the website OurBlackGirls.com, a source told them that Raymond McBride had gone missing in 2004. And the source that provided this information really didn't have many details. And there really only is one little sentence of a story of him over on The Charlie Project. It simply states that he was last seen on October 4th, 2004, walking in Jasper, Texas. He was walking west on U.S. Highway 190, and this was right in front of the McDonald's Mobile Home Park. According to family, he said he was probably going to be traveling to Houston or maybe even to Florida to see if he can find some work. But then no one ever saw him again. He never showed up anywhere. No phone calls. His social security number has never been used. There's no, like, arrest records in his name. He's just gone. Then, cut to three years later in 2007, 48-year-old mother and grandmother Beverly McBride, she goes missing. In August of 2007, Beverly was going to the Parkdale Mall to, I guess, meet her parents. She was going to be giving them some money so that they could pay one of her bills the following day because she worked and was not going to be able to pay that bill on time. It sounds like she did meet up with her parents and provided them that money. But then also this article talks about how the last time anyone ever saw her was actually at her job. 
I'm just unclear if that was later on after the mall or what. I'm not, I'm not sure. But regardless, Beverly never got home later that day. No one ever heard from her. No phone calls, nothing. She didn't show up to work the following day, so she was reported missing. On September 1st, 2007, Beverly was found. It was a Saturday, and someone was mowing the grass in that area when they came across a badly decomposed human body. The family's worst nightmares had come true. The body was identified as Beverly McBride. Because of how badly she was decomposed, there was, they could not determine exactly how she died. But it is ruled a homicide. And according to family, the clothing she was wearing was not the clothing she was last seen in. As a matter of fact, the shirt she was in, they said, her family said they had never seen her in that shirt before. And it sounds like the field that she was found in, it didn't really yield many other clues. Like there weren't any like shoe impressions in the dirt next to her. Um, but I do not know if they've tested anything for DNA or anything like that. I don't know. And it just sounds like there is just a lot of mystery to this because they don't really have much information. Apparently they had two different persons of interest, but those persons' names have never been released. And if they are still considered persons of interest or even suspects, I don't know. But no one's been arrested for her murder. No one's been charged or anything. I don't know what the motive was, if this was like a sexual crime, if this was a robbery gone wrong. I don't know if it was related to the disappearance of her husband. Sadly, there just is not much published about her case. But the Orange Police Department there in Texas are asking for the public's help with any information that can help lead to the answers, that can help bring justice to Beverly and her family. Somebody somewhere out there knows the truth, and perhaps that someone is you. If you have any information, please call 409-883-1026. This is the police. You gotta move this thing. What? Who is she? Oh my god! I'm gonna rob you, then I'm gonna kill you. Hello, Satan! Uh, hello, true crimers. This is the case of the Blind River Killer. Viewer discretion is advised. It was June 27th, 1991. Gordon and Jacqueline McAllister, who had been married, happily so, for nearly 40 years, and they had been living in Lindsay, Ontario, in Canada. They had an RV, and so they planned to go on a trip across Canada in it. On the way, they were going to visit family and friends. On June 27th, 1991, they would stop for a night at the Blind River Rest Stop. They were going to park their RV there and spend the night. It was the very early morning hours of June 28th, 1991. The two of them had been asleep and then were suddenly awoken by a knock at the door of their camper. The clip I played at the beginning was a recreation from Unsolved Mysteries. And this was one that used to scare the daylights out of me as a kid. The person that knocked on the door was screaming from the outside, claiming to be a police officer and needed to talk to whoever was in there. Now, nobody else was at the rest stop at this point. Jackie gets up and says she'll answer the door. And when she does, a man who looks like this barges in with two guns and says, first, I'm going to rob you, then I'm going to kill you. He then proceeds to steal all of their valuables, cash, jewelry, etc. When he is done doing that, he points one of his guns at Jackie and shoots her at close range. She is killed instantly. Gordon then tries to flee and he is shot in the back. Gordon manages to actually escape the RV and he rolls underneath it. When that happens, another car just so happens to pull into the rest stop. The guy gets out of his car and then sees this dude come out of the RV with two guns in his hand. The man, 29-year-old Brian Donald Major, then tries to rush back into his car. However, the assailant would quickly run in front of his car, pointed one of the guns directly at him, and shot him through the windshield, killing him as well. Gordon McAllister manages to stay hidden underneath the RV until the assailant leaves. He then gets into the RV and drives to the highway to flag down help. He doesn't even realize he had been shot in his back until that point. But police arrive at the rest stop after he flags people down and they find the body of Brian Major here in his vehicle. Gordon was rushed to the hospital, but he would survive his injuries. Initially, they came up with this sketch based on Gordon's recollection of the man, but then they would end up using a more highly advanced computer technology to make a better sketch. And they came up with this absolutely terrifying image. This is a computer rendering, not an actual photo. It's pretty impressive. 
Gordon said that he doesn't really think that the robbery was the actual motive. He says just by looking into this man's eyes and hearing the way he talked that he just wanted to kill someone. That this may have been some kind of thrill kill. He saw an RV parked alone in a rest stop and said, I'm going after them. However, this man has never been caught, not officially. In 1995, a man named Ronald West was arrested for several burglaries. He pled guilty to those and served about eight years in prison. Ronald West was a former police officer. And according to his ex-wife, Ronald owned a 22 caliber rifle and a 20 gauge shotgun, which just so happens to be the exact same two weapons that Gordon McAllister described as the killer had used in that robbery slash murder. His ex-wife also said he owned a blue van. That's relevant because just moments after all of this happened at the rest stop, a blue van was seen pulling out of it and speeding along the highway, almost crashing into another car. They don't know if this was actually the killer or if it was someone else who saw what happened and tried to get away. Ronald West would then later be arrested and charged with two other homicides. And those happened back in 1970. He would plead guilty to those murders and was sentenced to life in prison without parole. There is a good chance that he may be responsible for the murder of Jackie McAllister and Brian Major. He was a former cop and the guy knocked on their camper door saying he was a cop. He owned two guns that were very similar to the ones used in the killings. And he does bear a striking resemblance to this image. His ex-wife said that he did own a blonde wig, and he may have just been wearing a wig at the time of the murder. However, he has never been arrested or charged in connection with the Blind River murders. Those murders are technically still unsolved. This is another missing or murdered Indigenous persons case. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Brandon Riley Kempf. Viewer discretion is advised. At the time of this case, Brandon Kempf was just 18 years old. He was a Stillaguamish tribal member. I hope I said that right. This is the only photo of him that I can find. But he was born on November 28th, 1986. I know that he had one brother. And Brandon was someone who really, really, really loved being outdoors. Basically, if you couldn't find him, if you just looked out in the woods, he'd probably be there. He loved hiking, he loved going fishing, he would build furniture, specifically furniture for outdoors. He loved being outside with his grandma and gardening with her, or just tossing the ball to his beloved dog outside. But then suddenly something just happened to him. Brandon was last seen on August 11th, 2005. And I guess this was in like the Arlington and Granite Falls area of Washington State. That's where he lived his whole life. So apparently at some point that day, uh, an ambulance was called on behalf of Brandon because he was near a grocery store and people said he was be behaving very strangely. I just don't know if they ever made it to him because at that point after that, he was never seen again. Some people did observe him walking towards this particular area, the Mount Pilchuk lookout, but he would be reported missing. And like... With many indigenous persons' cases, I don't really see much information at all. However, on October 17th, 2005, two hikers found the skeletal remains of a person. Those remains uh, found, I guess, near the Mountain Loop Highway, uh, they would be identified. They were that uh, Brandon Kempf. At one point, a man uh, had started bragging about killing Brandon because, he, according to these stories, the man was bragging about it, uh, and he said he killed him because Brandon was... He, he had ratted someone out, basically for being a narc. That man is named Aaron J. Hillman, and police actually arrested him and charged him with his murder. But then, they dropped the charges. They said they had absolutely no physical evidence to corroborate these so-called rumors from friends of the supposed suspect. They also don't know 100% how Brandon actually died. It sounds like they still believe this was a homicide that he met with foul play, but they haven't really said what his actual cause of death was. But this guy said he had killed him and threw him over a cliff, which would make sense with where and how he was found. And they, you know, they have said that it is possible this was a homicide, but also this may have been an accident. This could have been a suicide. They just don't know. And they no longer consider Aaron Hillman a suspect. So if you have any information, please call 425-339-3463. She sat unidentified for 34 years, but finally they cracked the case. 
Hello, true crimerers. This is the case of Brenda Giroux. Viewer discretion is advised. It was April 8th, 1981 in Tucson, Arizona, just outside this location, which is the Pima County Fairgrounds. Two hikers would come across a very badly decomposed human body. They first noticed this individual because there was a jacket, I guess, hanging from one of these trees. That's how it caught their attention. The victim was female wearing this jacket with this shirt and these shoes and socks. This is a composite drawing they initially made of the victim, which to me that actually looks a lot more like Eileen Warnos, but the victim did not have any identification on her. They said that she was likely between the ages of 18 and 22 years old, and she had been killed by strangulation through a ligature. She had only been out there, they think, she died roughly two days prior to when she was found. But she was already in a pretty bad state of decomposition where they really couldn't get a good visual of her. But because of that, this case just went cold. They didn't know who she was, where she was from. They didn't know how she got to this final resting place. And then, around 2012, they would end up exhuming the body of the Jane Doe. And using her skull, they would do a reconstruction which is what prompted them to come up with this uh, reconstruction of the woman. Definitely a more accurate uh, depiction. And this image got police in Tucson, Arizona. It, it sparked uh, something that they remembered. A man was arrested in 1995, a man named John Kalhauser, and he was arrested for the murder of his wife. His wife's name was Diane Van Reef. When he was arrested, he had a photograph of a young woman on him. A photograph of this woman here. Police just kept it as evidence, though. He was later convicted of the murder of his wife, but police kept this photo as evidence. When they had this reconstruction done, they thought it looked a lot like the woman in that photo. And I think around 2015 or so, they were able to, by distributing her photo around, they were able to identify this woman as Brenda Giroux. Brenda was originally from New Hampshire. She was last seen alive by her family in New Hampshire in 1980. Brenda was 20 years old at the time and she left voluntarily with a man, someone she was dating at the time. That man was John Kalhauser. By that time, Mr. Kalhauser had already served time for committing manslaughter. He shot and killed an ex-girlfriend's boyfriend. And then after the disappearance of Brenda Giroux, he ends up killing uh, a, his wife. So you have a man who had been found guilty of killing one person. Then Brenda Giroux is last seen alive with this man traveling to Arizona where she was found. Then after she disappears, he ends up killing another person. One would think that he seems pretty guilty in this. And this is him more presently. He has never actually been charged with the murder of Brenda Giroux. He is considered a person of interest in the case. Now, while it seems obvious that this guy's a killer, he's killed at least two people, and it seems pretty obvious he probably killed Brenda, they also need proof to be able to establish that. And I believe they are still currently working on trying to find that proof. He had been sentenced to, I think, 20 years in prison for the murder of his wife, and in 2019, he was released from, a, from an Arizona prison. So I think they're trying to build a case to see if he really was the guy to kill Brenda, but they cannot say for certain that he is her killer. It sounds like he's denying it, but somebody murdered her, and that somebody deserves to be in prison for doing that. So hopefully police in Tucson are going to be able to get the evidence they need to get the right guy. And if it isn't uh, John Kalhauser, well... <laughs> Surely somebody somewhere out there has to know who it is. Someone has to know something about this case. If you have any information about Brenda's murder, please call 520-882-7463. Thirty-seven years after she was found murdered, she was finally identified. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of the Buckskin Girl. Viewer discretion is advised. It was April 24th, 1981 in Troy, Ohio, here along Greenlee Road. Some passerbys had discovered a human body in a ditch, and it was evident from first sight that she had been murdered. The problem though, and I can't show the image because TikTok, this is her like autopsy photo, but the problem was she had no identity on her. 
but the coroner determined that she had been beaten and then she had been strangled to death and then just thrown into the ditch like she was garbage. So at first they would release a sketch of the victim to see if anybody recognized her, but they didn't really get any information from that. She was seen wearing this top, this, this is the exact one, and it was uh, made from buckskin, which is why they would nickname her the Buckskin Girl. She also had on a brown and orange turtleneck, Wrangler blue jeans. She was between 18 and 26 years old, about five foot six and approximately 130 pounds. But despite everything being put out into the media, no one could identify her. At one point, she was potentially connected to a serial killer referred to as the Ohio Prostitute Killer, and she was also linked at one point to the Redhead Murders. However, I guess eventually over time, they would rule her out from being involved in those killings. And by the way, when she was found, she was in pigtails. I mean, you never know without my jog someone's memory. But there was a point when they also suspected maybe she was a victim of domestic abuse. Many years later, they would actually conduct pollen tests on some pollen found with her body. And they determined that she was maybe possibly from Canada or somewhere from the northeastern part of the United States. But it wouldn't be until 2017 when the DNA Doe Project got involved. So they uploaded her DNA. And then using genetic genealogy, ancestry websites, what have you, they were able to finally identify her. She was 21-year-old Marsha King. She was actually from Little Rock, Arkansas. Marsha was known to hitchhike, and she would leave town all the time. She was last seen in Arkansas in 1980, and at one point her family did report her missing. But with this being the 80s, they didn't, we didn't have like the communication that we have now. And so once they found her, they, this, they weren't able to link her to the missing person. You know, what we can do nowadays is we can plug it into a computer and we can find a match right away. Once they knew her identity, then information would come out that people had saw her in Kentucky and Pennsylvania. And they finally got a lot of more information about her as a person, who she may have met with. But they have not identified her killer. They're hoping they can get DNA from hairs found at her crime scene, but they are still unidentified. If you have information, please call 937-440-3990. Was it an accidental drowning or was it murder? Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Cassie Cole. Viewer discretion is advised. It was the holiday season in Tiffin, Ohio. The year was 2002. Cassie Cole had four sisters and a brother. She was a student here at Columbian High School. Everyone described Cassie as someone that was just really, really likable. She had a really fun and infectious personality. That the moment you met her, you were instantly friends. She, at the time of this case, was not having like any hard times at home. She was doing really well in school and she had absolutely no reasons to run away. It was Sunday night, November 24th, 2002. Cassie's mom, Mary, would say goodnight to her daughter and then she would head off to her night shift. That was sometime around 10 p.m. Before her mom left, though, she had noticed that when she was looking in her room that Cassie didn't have an alarm clock and she needed to be up early the following morning for school. Cassie told her mom, oh, don't worry, you know, my stepdad is going to wake me up in the morning. Her parents were divorced and so living at the house was her mom and her stepdad. But her mom thought that was kind of strange because at that time, I guess uh, Cassie and the stepfather weren't really getting along very well. But then Mary goes to work. And then early the following morning, the stepfather calls Mary at work and says, Cassie's missing. Now, Cassie was sleeping, I guess, in the family's rec room that night. The reason why is because she was doing one of those high school things where you had like a fake baby and you had to take care of that baby and it would it would like cry in the middle of the night and cassie was really really serious about taking care of that little baby but apparently this doll baby was left in the room the rec room and i guess it was crying and that's how maybe the stepfather knew but he couldn't find cassie anywhere according to him so her mom rushes home around 8 30 in the morning she calls columbian high school because that's when they take attendance and she asked, you know, was Cassie there? And according to the class she was supposed to be in, she was marked absent. And so Cassie was reported missing. The police labeled her a runaway, but the mom and her siblings were like, there's no way, that's just not her. Not to say it's impossible, but they just, they know their family. So Cassie's mom would, every single day, she would drive around to the popular lunch spots where the high schoolers would eat lunch. And she would check to see if maybe Cassie showed up. Maybe she did run away, but maybe she's still mingling with her friends. But she had no luck. 
When she disappeared, Cassie was only a month away from turning 15. Her mom said that Cassie is now forever 14 until she finds her. And unfortunately, they would find her soon. It was March 20th, 2003. Seneca County had recently began to thaw out because it was a very snowy winter. There were some high school kids hanging out kind of near the Sandusky River near the old Abbott Bridge when they saw a person's body right on the shores of the river. It was a very badly decomposed body of a young woman. It was soon identified as Cassie Cole. The coroner said that her cause of death was drowning, but it was pretty evident that she had been dead the entire four months that she was missing meaning she likely died the day she disappeared. But they did searches and they never found her. Now, obviously the snow may have hindered that, but it's possible that she may have been placed there after the fact, maybe some months down the road to be found maybe when the snow melted. The police there have not officially labeled her case a homicide, but a suspicious death. They are definitely not ruling out foul play. As a matter of fact, they think that foul play absolutely could have been involved here. But all they really have right now is just that she drowned. People can drown accidentally. Hundreds of people would be questioned and many of those people agreed to take polygraph tests and they all passed. Cassie's family firmly believes that she was murdered. And honestly, it, it does seem like that's the case. One of the reasons why is because Cassie was a huge swimmer. They called her a dolphin. She loved being in the water. So it doesn't make sense that she died by drowning if it was an accident. A suspect in her case has never been named. Persons of interest have never been named. The police are still hoping they can get information from somebody about what happened to Cassie and how she ended up there and drowned. Somebody somewhere out there knows the truth and perhaps that someone is you. If you have any information about the mysterious death of Cassie Cole, please contact the Seneca County Sheriff's Department at 419-447-3456. If you're trying to hide from the law, maybe try to control your urge to eat a quesalupa. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Clayton Daniels. Viewer discretion is advised. It was June 18th, 2004. The Burnett County Sheriff's Department in Texas was informed that a car was found completely engulfed in flames. It appeared that this car had fallen down this cliff or embankment and then somehow caught on fire. Inside the vehicle, they found partial human remains. Essentially, it was skeletal remains that had been completely charred and burnt to an absolute crisp. There was no head, there was no hands, there was no feet. The fire was so bad that the tires had melted into the rocks. Something that's highly unusual for an accident like this. That fire had to be so hot that it literally destroyed parts of this person's body. The vehicle was registered to one Clayton and Molly Daniels. In the vehicle with the body, they did find a piece of a shoe, which matched a shoe that Clay Daniels was known to wear. They also found pieces of jewelry in the car that were confirmed by the family to have belonged to Clay Daniels. So based solely on that, at that point, they had no way of identifying him with dental records or fingerprints. They would say that they believed the body in the car was Clay Daniels. And it didn't really seem to upset a lot of people. Clay Daniels was known as kind of a piece of shit. He was not well liked by the community. He had committed several crimes. He was a problem for police. And he had recently been arrested for sexually assaulting his seven-year-old cousin. And he was convicted of that and unbelievably only sentenced to 30 days in prison and 10 years probation. His body was found in that car literally days before he was supposed to start that prison sentence. The timing was unbelievable. And they believed at first that, well, what if the victim's family, because they were pissed about the sentence, what if they did something to him? What if they killed him? They examined the car and the gas tank was completely intact. They checked the inner workings of the vehicle. They were trying to discover if this car lit up on fire based on natural occurrences but they could find absolutely nothing to suggest that. There was no internal damage to the vehicle. There was no indication that the vehicle was damaged in the sense that it had gotten some kind of accident. There were no skid marks on the road. Some of the vegetation had been kind of slightly pressed down on the hill where the car had gone down. And they indicated to crash recreation experts that the car did not drive down the hill. It was likely pushed down this hill. Then they determined that there was an accelerant used in this fire. A charcoal-based, like, lighter fluid was used, and a lot of it was used. This was an arson. Someone set this car on fire on purpose. 
Then they pulled DNA from the bone marrow found in the victim in the car. Turns out, it was not Clay Daniels. Not only did the DNA say it was not his body, but further analysis of the bones would indicate that this was actually the body of an elderly woman. And then something even stranger happened. Molly Daniels' sister had gone into Molly's bedroom for a second to get something. When she turned around, she noticed a man, as a recreation, sleeping in Molly's closet. When she goes to tell Molly, again another recreation, Molly goes back to the room with her, suddenly the man is gone. Molly was set to get about $100,000 in life insurance policy from his death. So they began to wonder, was Molly involved in whatever happened here? They began to follow her around. They followed her to a Taco Bell one time when she got into a vehicle with her new boyfriend, who her two children, because he, her and Clay had two kids, the, the two kids had said to this new boyfriend, oh, he, that's daddy, that's daddy. And she's like, no, it's not daddy. It's not daddy. What are you talking about? But they follow her to this Taco Bell and she, they see her eating dinner with this new boyfriend. This is the new boyfriend. This is him the day, that day. He was arrested that day. Notice any similarities between Clay Daniels and the new boyfriend? You do? Because it's the same person. He did virtually nothing to disguise himself. Clay Daniels was not dead, and Molly knew it. They get a warrant to search Molly's home, and they find charcoal lighter fluid. By using some fancy science, they determined that it was the exact lighter fluid used in the vehicle fire. Molly tried to tell police, I had no idea that Clay was still alive. He came to my house like a month later and said, oh, look at Surprise, I'm alive. And that she had nothing to do with the whole arson and body thing in the car. But based on some of her internet usage and her search history, they found out that she was lying. Her motive for this was money, $100,000. His motive, also collecting that $100,000 life insurance policy money. And also, he did not want to serve any prison time for the sexual assault of a seven-year-old child. He also didn't want to become labeled a sex offender. So they staged his death. Who was the body, though? Well, they found a cemetery called Pebble Mound near where the accident took place. There, they discovered a recently disturbed gravesite. They found a coffin in there, obviously, but the coffin was empty. It belonged to an elderly woman which they would then confirm was the body found inside the car. She had died sometime prior to this. So Clay and Molly dug up this body to use to put in the car. Her name was Charlotte Davis, by the way, and she was then reburied and laid back to rest. Clayton and Molly would both plead guilty to charges including insurance fraud and desecration of a corpse, amongst other crimes. Clayton was sentenced to 30 years in prison Molly was sentenced to 20 years in prison. They divorced while they were both serving their time. Molly served 12 years and was released in 2016. As far as I know, Clayton is still in prison. Let's read some more funny courtroom transcripts from Overheard Courthouse on Instagram. Witness, he mooned me. Judge, sir, did you moon her? Defendant, no, but your honor, just so the court knows, I do sleep in my birthday suit. During a trial for homicide, defense attorney, you knew the decedent well, right? Witness, I knew him very well. I dated him for 14 months. I knew how his butthole smells and how his d*** tastes. Okay. <laughs> Defendant at arraignment, I just don't get why I'm even here right now. Judge, you're here because you ran from the police. Defendant, confused, I thought I was supposed to run. No, honey, no. During a voir dire for marijuana sales case, DA, who here thinks this case is a waste of time? Everyone. Me! Facts, though. Prosecutor. First of all, you never made an objection. Second of all, she's had sex before. She knows what a direct p*** is. What is the context? During a calendar call. Matter adjourned till 6-12. Attorney. Um, it's 626 today. Clerk. Better get a DeLorean. Oh, that was a quick response from the clerk. I like that. Defense attorney, at some point during this incident, you retrieved your backpack. The witness, yes. Defense, and that is because you keep your firearm in that backpack? Witness, no, I had some barbecue packed up from earlier. Okay, but same, like if I had barbecue in a backpack, I'm going for it. I don't, no matter what the cost, I'd shoot me, but I, I'm going for that barbecue that I saved. Let's read some more funny courtroom transcripts from Overheard Courthouse on Instagram. Child being removed from mom due to it testing positive for cocaine at birth. Counsel for mom. Mom needs to have visits with the child so she can breastfeed. Court, she can't breastfeed. Counsel for mom. Oh, that's right, no cocaine for the baby. 
bitch. I'm sorry. Judge, attorneys, please approach. Why are they British always? ASA approaches and stands on toes to see over the bench. Judge, I've been meaning to get a step stool in here. That's fucked up. <laughs> Judge calls case. Defendant isn't present. State, your honor, state is requesting a bench warrant. Defense, it's giving he's in custody, your honor. <laughs> uh, Gen Z are lawyers now. <laughs> Defense attorney, did you talk to him after his arrest? Officer, I asked him what he had to drink tonight. Defense attorney, what did he tell you? Officer, he said, your mom was pussy. <laughs> <laughs> Shit, okay. Defendant, this is the worst jail I've ever been to. How many have you been to? Prosecutor, zero out of 10, would not recommend. Stop committing crimes. <laughs> Your Honor, the defendant has a three-year-old dependent at home. Judge, is it his child? Public defender. No, no it's his shih tzu named Coco. <laughs> Shit, I have a lot of dependents then at home. Father in prison fighting over custody of his child. Your Honor, I'm not in federal prison for trafficking firearms. I'm in here for false statements during the purchase of firearms. Judge. Oh, so like, <laughs> so like Hunter Biden. Damn. Judge, do you understand the terms of the plea agreements? Defendant. Okay. Judge, yes or no? Defendant, maybe so? Judge, I, I can't even be mad. <laughs> Commonwealth requests $500,000 cash bail. Defense attorney, uh, your honor, my client isn't El Chapo, so she's a 15 year old girl who's here for shoplifting. $500,000 is crazy. Prosecutor, also the defendant is banned from attending strip clubs for the duration of his probation. Bailiff, that is cruel and unusual punishment. <laughs> Why is the bailiff chiming in? What is this, Judge Judy? Middle-aged woman wearing a nightgown using video visitation in the jail lobby. Well, fuck it, man. I ain't coming to see your ass ever again. Always talking about you got hoes. Where they at, man? Slams phone, walks out. I just assumed they were Southern. Judge, would you like the jury polled? Defendant. I don't even know what that means. Oh, <laughs> uh, shit. Defendant entering a plea to a drug misdemeanor. Judge, well, tell me what ways you're working on your sobriety and I'll waive what fines and fees I can. Defendant, well, I'm not. Well, I ain't got no money, so now I'm sober. That's how. <laughs> hey, as long as you're sober, who cares how it happened? Potential new client at the start of a Zoom consultation. Client, I wanted to talk to you specifically because in researching law firms, I feel like these attractive hot lawyers don't work as hard. So I wanted a normal guy who works so hard he's balding. Attorney, bald. Okay. Potential pro se. The law says you can't represent yourself if you're seriously mentally ill, but I'm not seriously mentally ill, just a little bit. Aren't we all? Judge, do you understand the laws pertaining to your case? Defendant. I was actually going to ask you, Judge, do you know of any laws that will help me out? Mm? You know, bitch is crazy. Hello, true crimers. This is the case of Pastor Craig Hodson. Fewer discretion is advised. So this case occurred in Hakumba, which is in the San Diego County area, uh, which is wild because I grew up in San Diego and I don't think I've ever heard the name Hakumba before. At the time of this case, Pastor Craig Hodson is 55 years old and he is the father to 11 children. He is also a grandfather. He was a pastor here at Grace Baptist Church and he was extremely well loved in this community. I guess he was initially a propane driver, but then eventually he found his way into ministry and became a pastor full time. I don't have a photo of the house or the property, but I guess he lived near the Golden Acorn Casino and part of his property, I guess he rented out to people. One of those individuals he rented out to is a 61 year old man named Paul David Carr. I have been looking forever to find his photo. I cannot find it, which is shocking because this was a very recent case. Craig was a, a very understanding and fair landlord, but eventually Paul David Carr would overstay his welcome. It got to a point where Paul David Carr was just extremely like rude to everyone on the property. He would roam wherever he wanted to. One time he told one of Craig's daughters that he just told her to go to hell. Paul had anger issues, he was mean. And so eventually by October of 2016, Craig was like, all right, we've had enough. And he was going to issue an eviction notice to Paul. On October 16th, 2016, that's exactly what he did. Craig would have these notarized legal documents, all very legit. And he presented them to Paul David Carr. 
Well, Paul uh, was not thrilled with that. Paul threatened to get his own attorney to fight the eviction notice. Now, Craig had then gone to the Baptist church. He did his sermon, and then sometime later that evening, he came back home. Craig was doing some cleanup in the garage when Paul David Carr approached him. And then suddenly, gunshots. Four gunshots rang out. Two of them missed, but the other two hit Craig. One in his arm and one through his aorta. And he would be pronounced dead at the scene. Paul David Carr would later go on to state that that Craig picked up this nine foot long chainsaw pole and threatened him with it. And that so he said he shot him in self-defense. But there was no actual evidence or proof that that actually occurred. By all accounts, Paul David Carr just walked up to him, argued for a bit, and then shot him, firing four shots. So Paul David Carr, this is his inmate record, he was arrested and charged with the murder. At his trial, the defense tried to say this was self-defense, but they couldn't prove it. And so Paul David Carr was convicted of the murder, and he was sentenced to life in prison without parole. Hell, what the fuck? Um, hello? Do you have my Wendy's Frosty or what? Grubhub is getting far too personal these days. Do you need some privacy or? So I thought, hi, I thought I would do something a little bit different and show some unsettling things found on ring cameras, make a video about that. I actually found these on a, a YouTube channel called Urbex Hill. And okay, he's back at it. So this happened in Salinas, California in 2019. The owners of the house were not actually home at the time, but they were they got an alert on their phone because a motion sensor was activated. Apparently, once the authorities got these images, they pretty much identified him pretty quickly. He was a guy who had been uh, arrested before for like loitering and theft. And he didn't know the owners, uh, and clearly something was just mentally very wrong with him. So the next video is it, pretty disturbing, uh, comes from this individual here. So she said, this is what I've been dealing with since October 31st. This man has been outside of my apartment almost every night. I have contacted everyone that I know to contact about this. What is it going to take for y'all to protect and serve? This is the video. the dude was publicly identified but the the individual who this happened to gave an update says i'm safe for now i have friends and family here that confronted him so hopefully he stays away since my post had gone viral last night security did two routines throughout the night just thank you for everyone for the continued support so it was just a guy who just continually stopped and looked at her apartment and just stood there uh it's when people aren't moving that's what i find the most disturbing Unlike this fella. Oh, 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 should we leave? Oh, so, uh, <laughs> oh, oh, the eyes. So the woman was home at the time this happened and she calls police and he's still there. And so they arrest him. It doesn't sound like she knew who this man was or why he went to her house. And it's obvious that the guy was something out of his mind. Creepy all the same. But if you want like a lot more context into these with a lot more stories featured in them, that YouTuber Urbex Hill has like a 12 or 13 minute long video about these. Oh, hello. 
Hi. Ow. Ow. No, ma'am, you can't unlock my head. Ow. Okay. That's not the lock either. She's trying to unlock the camera? She's trying to unlock everything but the lock! Thought I would do some more creepy uh, doorbell camera things. So this lady, who looks like she had just recently gotten into a fight with someone and lost, she walked up to this individual's home in the middle of the night and was just using her keys trying to enter the home. Now the next part wasn't on camera, but according to the homeowner, she then started to throw rocks at the homeowner's car. And then she just left. But imagine just like getting an alert on your phone and then boom, you see this. So then, oh, hi. Yeah, I see you. So the next one is from a woman's uh, doorbell camera where she caught someone who was literally trying to not be seen on camera, then covering the camera. And it later would turn out that this was the woman who lived in the house. This was her ex. What did he do after he covered the camera? He set her car on fire, which then spread to the house and the house caught on fire. Nobody was harmed in this. What a sneak attack. Bye. Oh. Okay. And yes, he was arrested. So this one happened in around Chicago, Illinois. This guy would approach several houses uh, in one evening, claiming he was a detective named Jeff Rushmore. Turns out, that was a lie. He was just some normal dude in his early 20s, for some reason posing as a cop and trying to get people to open their doors. One person actually did, but thankfully nobody was harmed. It's unclear as to why he did this, what the motive was. Was there a plan to get them to open the door and then they, they would bum rush him and then steal stuff from his house? Or this is why you never open your door for anybody you do not know. Can you open the door? 26, I got you out. Hill Park, Mr. K21, gonna be the sixth person. Uh, I'm sorry, Northcoa. I'm sorry, Northcoa. It's like PD is with the McCash Company. Cute badge. His radio is his phone. So the video footage just stops there, but the guy inside was not hurt and he, no one actually entered his home. He actually got this dude to leave. Turns out it was an operation by these four guys. Look at this guy in the corner. Early prototype for the Joker. So the one going to the doors was a man named Thomas Cozy, I believe this top guy. The other three were in the car and they were driving from house to house and doing this pretending to be a police officer thing. But to what end? I don't know. I know they were all arrested and arraigned in court, but there doesn't appear to be an update since 2019. Speaking of people posing as someone they're not, this is one where a woman goes to someone's door posing as a DoorDash driver in the middle of the night. The occupant of the home did not order anything. They were fast asleep. Turns out something a little bit more nefarious was planned that night. Jesus. Imagine hearing a knock at the door that late at night. <laughs> That's the person's backyard. So the homeowner also had a camera in their backyard and it caught four gentlemen, what they think is gentlemen, running and chopping over their fence. 
So it's believed that the supposed DoorDash driver was either trying to get the person to open the door so that they could rush in, but then since nobody answered, the four people back here went to the backyard and attempted to get into the house from a window, but they failed, they couldn't do it, so then they all bolted. These four individuals and this woman, they've never actually been caught, they've never been apprehended. So the police there in Spring, Texas are asking for the public's help if they know anything about this. If you do, you can call 936 760-5800. Once again, folks, never open your door to someone you do not know. This is why I have DoorDash or Instacart just drop my stuff off and they don't even knock on my door. I wait for them to leave before I even get my stuff. What is a movie line that you find funny that was never intended to be funny? This one, <laughs> this one is mine. What's in the bag? A shark or something? Icy silence. Oh, shit. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Danny Weeks. Viewer discretion is advised. So this case occurred in Monroe, Louisiana, and unfortunately, I cannot find any photos of anyone other than Danny Weeks. Not even the murder victim in this case or the co-defendants. It was the day after Christmas in 1981 in a rural road just outside of Monroe where the body of a man was found. The man was a sergeant major and his name was Hubert Esther. He was a career military man. He had blunt force trauma to his head and he had been shot in his chest and in his arm with a shotgun. Hubert Esther was married to a woman named Patricia. After the body was discovered, they of course would interview Patricia and they would also interview people associated with you know, this couple. And this is how they discovered that Patricia had been having an affair with a man. That man was named Danny Michael Weeks. So since police then got his name, they were able to branch off with their investigation and go and look at different things. They discovered that Patricia had offered to buy uh, Mr. Weeks a gun. And they eventually discovered that Patricia had actually asked Danny Weeks to kill her husband. And Patricia lured her husband out to the rural road, that's such a hard word to say, where then Danny Weeks and one other person had accosted Hubert and then killed him. So Danny Weeks and Patricia and this other individual were all arrested and charged with connection to this murder. They had the testimony of the co-defendant, the person who was there that night, I think it was one of his relatives, who testified against Danny and Patricia. I believe for like a lesser sentence. And it was a very damning testimony. Not to mention other witnesses had come forward to state that he had said he had killed this guy and it seemed to be pretty signed, sealed and delivered. So he was convicted and he was sentenced to life in prison. Patricia was also found guilty of orchestrating this murder and she was sentenced to life in prison. Danny was serving his time at the Louisiana State Penitentiary, but in, on August 24th, 1986, he, along with another inmate, managed to escape. The other individual, James Colvin, who escaped, was actually later apprehended in 1986 in Los Angeles, California. But Danny Weeks remained at large. On March 20th, 1988, they finally got a tip about where Danny Weeks may be. He had been recently arrested by the FBI in Seattle, Washington, for kidnapping a woman. The woman who obviously went through was traumatic, but she did survive. He did not kill her. But once they found out about this, they traveled to Seattle, Washington, and they confirmed it was the Danny Weeks that escaped from the prison. And he was then returned back to the Louisiana State Penitentiary. He would later be convicted on two charges of kidnapping and also charged with his prison escape. And his sentence was then upped to two consecutive life sentences without the possibility of parole. Hello, true crimeers. This is the recent disappearance of Daryl Johnson. Viewer discretion is advised. Daryl Ray Johnson Sr., who I guess would go by the nickname Bubba. He was born in 1956, and so he is 67 years old. Pictured behind me is the Lake Conscious State Park in New Mexico, and Daryl was reported missing from there on June 29th, 2024. He was brought there by a close friend. I guess they were celebrating a birthday there. It was like a, a camping birthday celebration type thing. Daryl was last seen in the very early morning hours of June 29th, 2024 at approximately 12.30 a.m. He had asked an individual in a neighboring tent if they had a flashlight. And then after that, he wasn't seen again. And he hasn't been seen since. 
Now, in terms of people who were a part of this camping trip, birthday celebration thing, there was about 30 or so people there. And according to people who were there with them, they saw him go into his tent at about 11 p.m. and it was zipped up. And that was technically on the night of June 28th. But apparently no one actually saw him unzip his tent and actually walk out of it. So it sounds like there may be some discrepancies there between the people who last saw him getting into his tent and then who this person was that said he came to their tent to ask for a flashlight after 12.30 a.m. But regardless, nobody has seen him. Daryl was last seen wearing a red t-shirt with blue jeans and a pair of brown shoes. Again, he is 67 years old. He is six foot, 160 pounds, with salt and pepper brown and gray hair and brown eyes. The family is still trying to figure out exactly what happened. They don't know if this was an accidental thing. They don't know if he willingly chose to just walk away or if foul play was involved. And so the first thing to do is to find him. According to a family member, there were drones that were flown over the area after he was reported missing to see if they could find him. The park rangers did a search of the area and neither of those things turned up anything. The family is now trying to get the local authorities to actually investigate this case and for them to do an official search and rescue for him because that has not actually happened yet. But there is a police report on the case and that report number is N as in Nancy, M as in Mary, S, P as in Paul, R, 2409469. The family just wants him home. They want to know what happened to him. There is contact information to like a, the family directly. Daryl is actually originally from Phoenix, Arizona. Or you can call 1-800-457-3463 and you can report your information anonymously. You do not have to say who you are. You just have to say what you know. So if you have information, please help bring Daryl home to his family. This is a tragic example to show that every murder always has more than one victim. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Eileen Cotter. Viewer discretion is advised. I don't know much about Eileen. I do know at the time of this case, she was 22 years old and living in North London. Eileen's biological mother had passed away when she was younger and her father remarried and he had a, a child with his second wife. I did read in one article that Eileen, I guess, had some learning disabilities but she always seemed to do well. However, at the time of this case, she had started a life of sex work. And unfortunately, that may have led to her death. It was June 1st, 1974, in this garage courtyard that the body of a young woman was found. That body would be identified as 22-year-old Eileen Cotter. Eileen was partially clothed. Uh, she had a black eye and they determined that she died from strangulation. And it was evident that she had some type of sexual intercourse prior to her death. And I believe they think that this was a rape. They do believe that she was like assaulted in this gentleman's car. And then once she was dead, he just threw her out of his car and sped off. However, this being 1974, forensic science just wasn't a thing yet. So they had to do some like old school gumshoeing to see if they can catch this guy. They would put undercover female officers in positions while being protected to see if they can lure any potential predators into a trap to see if maybe this guy is the killer. However, this never yielded any actual results and it would go unsolved until 2019 when the case was reopened. Luckily, initially, the case was investigated very thoroughly and they collected a lot of evidence. Among that evidence was male bodily fluid, which in 2019, they built a profile with that. And this man here, 80-year-old John Applegren, he had been arrested for physically assaulting his third wife. And when he pled guilty to that, he gave up his DNA. That DNA, when they plugged it into their database, it matched the DNA found with Eileen. Initially, he denied having anything to do with it. This is what he looked like back then. He said he never met her or anything. But then when they said, well, we got your DNA, he said, oh, okay, I had sex with her, but then I left. Based on tons of witness interviews, the forensic evidence, they knew it was him who killed her. So he goes on trial at the age of 80 in June of 2023. He's found not guilty of murder. However, he is found guilty of manslaughter. He's sentenced to a whopping 10 years in prison. 
After her murder, Eileen's parents weren't the same. Her stepmother killed herself, which caused her father to become an alcoholic and admit himself into a hospital. Her brother was put into the foster system, where he became a victim of child abuse. Her murder decimated an entire family. A young girl would have to play dead until her would-be killer would leave. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Elizabeth Reiser. Viewer discretion is advised. At the time of this case, Elizabeth Reiser was 17 years old, and she was just a few days shy of graduating from high school. Elizabeth was one of four kids. She was the oldest, and she had three younger brothers. By all accounts, this was a really good, happy, religious family. Elizabeth always did well in school. She loved to laugh and just had a really infectious personality. Her best friend was 18-year-old Brandy Hicks. The two of them spent a lot of time together. And that's exactly what they were doing on May 23rd, 2000. So this is in New Philadelphia, Ohio. That night, Elizabeth and Brandy, they had gone here to the Buckeye Career Center because Elizabeth had a choir practice. After that, they went to Hollywood Video to rent a couple of movies, and the plan was to go back to Brandy's house to watch them. Elizabeth was going to be spending the night. The girls had school the following morning, but because they were a couple of days away from graduation, they had both completed all of their final assignments, so their parents said that this was okay. Now, sometime shortly after walking out of the Hollywood video, the two girls were stopped by a man. The man asked the girls if he could bum a ride from them. He would pay them 20 bucks. At first, they were both really reluctant. They were like, eh, we probably shouldn't. But also because of their faith and they wanted to help, you know, a fellow stranger, they ultimately ended up allowing him in their car. So Brandy was driving the car and the man would give her directions where to go. Then suddenly the man changed the directions altogether. This then made the girls uncomfortable, so they told him to get out of the car. But that's when he drew a gun on both of them. He then forced Brandy to drive to this really desolate wooded area, where he then took her shoelaces and tied her to the steering wheel. He then forced Elizabeth at gunpoint to get out of the car and walk into the woods. This man then took a knife and he just slit her throat and then stabbed her several times in her neck and at the top of her head. He killed her. He then goes back to the car where he takes Brandy out of it and shows her the body of her dead best friend. He then forces her back into the car and he takes over driving the car. He put socks on his hands to not get fingerprints on the steering wheel. He took her to this abandoned railroad car over the Tuscarawas River where he attempted to sexually assault her, but he failed. Now, he had broken his knife when he stabbed Elizabeth, and he threw part of it into the woods. He then attempted to snap Brandy's neck not once, not twice, but three times. Failed every time. He then took one of her shoelaces and wrapped it around her neck and suffocated her. She then made a very quick decision. She needed to play dead, and that's exactly what she did. Thinking that she had been killed from suffocation, the man threw her over this bridge, but unbelievably, her foot got stuck on part of the track and she ends up hanging over the edge and she has to instinctively remind herself to stay playing dead. He then frees her foot, which then she falls into the river below. He doesn't leave right away. So she has to sit there completely motionless in the water until he leaves. She did this for an hour and then the man finally left. Once he is gone, she then manages to get out of the river and she runs to call 911. She gives a very detailed description of the man and police were able to find Elizabeth's body to confirm her story. And it wouldn't be long until they find out who it was. It was a 27 year old father of three named Matthew Vaca. You see, he had shown Elizabeth's body later on to a friend of his named Jeff Mullinix. And eventually that leads Jeff to contact the police, which then leads them right back to this guy, who looks like a Kroger brand Napoleon Dynamite. Once they brought him in, Brandy was able to identify him as their attacker. He is then charged with murder, attempted murder, kidnapping, robbery, a whole slew of things. He also had a laundry list of a criminal past. Eventually, it sounds like he would admit that he was the one, and he was on drugs that night. So he gets convicted of the murder and all the other charges, and he is sentenced to 96 years in prison. Elizabeth's mom um, did the unthinkable. She actually forgave this man. She even went to the prison to visit him, to pray with him. He even apologized to her in these private 
pray sessions. She actually even encouraged him to please not try taking your own life, which, I mean, that's just remarkable amounts of strength on her, on her part. I don't think I could be that way. But this man won't be eligible to be released from prison until 2096. He'll never be free. My impression of every ghost hunting show ever. All right, we're investigating in the house uh, built in 1293. Is there anyone here who wants to talk to us tonight? Maybe you want to discuss that one time where you had your head slowly and painfully in agonizing terror ripped completely off from your body. That must have been pretty upsetting for you. What was that? What was that? It sounded like a full, like a full drum piece going off. Do they have drums? Did, did they play drums back in the year 1306? It's a residual drum haunting here. Did you hear that? Did you hear that? It sounded like someone, I just heard a female voice go, I was crazy. Oh, did you see that? Did you see that? I saw a full human, full apparition just walk past. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, right in the spot where none of our cameras are currently pointed, including the right now. Just stay, stay focused on me. Don't, don't. We'll edit that in post. What the fuck is post? Oh, oh my God, did you hear that? That's not like a, like a cough. That was me. What? Sorry, Tad, that was me, I coughed. No, 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 no. This was different, this wasn't that. This was, this was a disembodied cough. All right, well, we're getting ready to, uh, to leave here. Holy shit. The trichoplop detector is, is going off like crazy. Oh, it's an air freshener, okay. Excuse you? Jesus. What is this? What, what fresh hell is this? Where are we at now? What, what's... Okay, it seems pretty slow. Oh, is this what scissoring is? Is this what they mean when, they're, when they say they're scissoring? No? Okay, I don't know, maybe. I'm, I'm new with this. Um, they're upside down and it's basically stopped. Okay, no thank you. No. No. Here we go around the crazy mobile, we're gonna die right now. What the fuck is wrong with people who do shit like this? No. No. Mm -mm. Pass. Hard pass. Goodbye. This is another Death Set Theme Parks. Viewer discretion is advised. So the ride I showed you at the beginning was a variation of this ride here called The Hawk. It was the Hawk 24 model. So this one just has one arm pendulum thing. Whereas the one I showed you in the beginning obviously had two. That one was called the Hammerhead Shark at Six Flags. So this story occurred at the Rockin' Raceway Amusement Park, which is located in Pigeon Forge, Tennessee. It seems like it's like just like a really big arcade with some amusement rides. I'm kind of confused by it. So as you saw, the pendulum goes, it swings up and goes back and forth. And at one point it kind of just hovers where everyone is upside down for a few moments. Now the ride has a built-in safety feature that's meant to disable the ride if any of the harnesses was not connecting. However, sometime in the early 2000s, the park's general manager at the time disabled that safety feature. He rewired it in order for the ride to bypass that. Soon after he did that, it resulted in a man almost falling out of the ride when it was upside down when his harness came undone. Luckily, that man was able to push his feet alongside another seat to keep him up in the ride. But in 2004, another woman was not so lucky. Before the ride began, she noticed that her harness was not properly secured. Because the safety feature was now disabled, it did not alert anyone. However, she is screaming and saying, my harness is not done, my harness is not done. The ride operator says, ah, oh, no, you're fine. And he lets the ride go. As it's going, she is screaming for her life because her harness has now come undone because it wasn't properly secured. It malfunctioned. But again, th the ride wasn't gonna stop because the safety feature was disabled. And so what happens to her? While the ride is upside down in this position, she falls to her death, landing on the concrete below. 
An investigation into this said that the accident was caused by intentional destruction of the safety features of this ride. The park's general manager who disabled that safety feature, his name is Stan Martin. He would be convicted of reckless homicide for basically killing that woman. There was also going to be a, a case against the ride's manufacturer, the ones who created this ride. But they were found not liable for the death because they had the safety feature built in. It was the park operator who disabled it. Their ride was in perfectly normal condition before he did that. It was 100% safe. By the way, Stan Martin, what was his sentence? No jail time. He got four years probation, a $5,000 fine, and plus 200 hours of community service. In my opinion, he was directly responsible for that death. He should have been in jail. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Gail Islieb. Reviewer discretion is advised. At the time of this case, Gail and Doug Islieb had been married for about three years or so, and they both had children from previous relationships. Gail at this time was 54 years old. They lived here in this home in Manchester, Connecticut. Gail, who was also a very devoted and loving grandmother, she worked at the shoe department at a local Walmart. She worked the night of April 30th, 1996, and she got off sometime around 10 p.m. Gail would then make her drive back home, and her husband heard her pulling into the driveway, when all of a sudden he heard a commotion and the sound of gunshots coming from just outside. And that's when he made that 911 call he played at the beginning. He had actually ran outside immediately after the shooting and he noticed a man wearing a mask running away from Gail's car. He goes back inside the house to retrieve his own gun while calling 911. But when he gets back outside, he finds that his wife is dead. She had been shot numerous times in the front seat of her car. She had been slumped over towards the passenger seat. There was glass everywhere. And later police would find several bullets. They found several shell casings. And these all came from a 22 caliber weapon. Gail had seven shots to her body. Five of them were point blank range to her head. When police arrived, they actually saw Doug holding a 22 caliber revolver, which was later put on the kitchen counter. But after test firing the gun, they realized it was not the gun that shot and killed Gail and he was quickly cleared as a suspect. In her car was her purse, her wallet, money, everything. So this wasn't a robbery. And really all the witnesses could say was, is that they saw a white vehicle speeding away from the scene after the shots. Police would interview her em fellow employees at the Walmart she worked at. They discovered there was a particular employee who seemed to be infatuated with Gail, a man named Tyrone Montgomery. He would actually come in on his days off and follow Gail around. So they find out where he lives, they go there, but he is not home, but they do see a white car matching the description that witnesses gave parked out front. In the car, they found a burnt note, which they would later attempt to piece back together, and they found several other notes. The notes indicated that Tyrone was planning to kill someone or maybe abduct someone and try to get some kind of ransom money. They actually thought based on the fact that he said he was gonna stick an ice pick through his ear, that Doug was possibly the target. They compared the handwriting from Tyrone's Walmart application and confirmed that the handwriting was a match to the ones found in the car, the notes. So why was she targeted? Did Tyrone kill her because he, she turned him down? Or did he think he would be able to get money out of her? Well, they would need to find Tyrone first to find out the answer to that question. They discovered that he had actually checked himself into a psychiatric hospital shortly after this murder happened. Tyrone actually checked himself into the hospital because he said a friend of his just died and he was feeling suicidal. At this point, they also find out that Tyrone had actually pulled a BB gun on Gail before, but Gail never filed any kind of reports against him. The police interviewed him at the hospital and he said he had nothing to do with her murder. When they go to retrieve the clothing he arrived in the hospital at, they found out that the hospital had actually washed his clothing. So any evidence on them was gone. But in his boot, they found a little tiny piece of glass. There was glass all around the car, especially outside the car where the shooter would have been standing. They took some of the glass fragments from here and the glass fragment they found in Tyrone's boot, doing some fancy science stuff and with lights and all that. 
they discovered that it was from this, the glass in his boot was from this particular window. At that point, they're finally able to get a warrant to search Tyrone's home. They found books in his room about hitmen and committing crimes. And in his basement bedroom, he also had a makeshift firing range. They were able to take bullets from the wall of his room, and they found shell casings there too. The bullets, unfortunately, were badly damaged and they couldn't be used to compare. However, they were able to take the shell casings from the crime scene and his home, and they were a match. But police wanted the murder weapon, but it was nowhere in his home. They go back to the gun department of Walmart, and they actually find out that the guy who works in that department had sold a 22 caliber weapon to Tyrone. But after the murder, he fudged the numbers to make it look like he didn't. So they found out the serial number and then found the gun that had actually been sold again by Tyrone. And the gun, they test fired it. It was a match. This was the murder weapon. This was the gun that Tyrone had purchased. They believe his plan was to murder Doug and then kidnap Gail and do whatever God knows what to her, possibly hold her for ransom. But when she pulled into the driveway and he accosted her, he must have panicked and just shot her seven times and then fled the scene. Tyrone Montgomery was then arrested and charged with the murder of Gail and he would go to trial and he was found guilty of her murder. It was a completely senseless murder of a loving mother and grandma, a joyous person who never did anything wrong to anyone. And for her murder, Tyrone Montgomery was sentenced to 65 years in prison. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Janelle Plude. Viewer discretion is advised. Janelle Johnson was born on January 7th, 1971. And at the time of this case, she is 28 years old and she is married to this man here. His name is Doug Plude and they lived in Landa Lakes, Wisconsin. It was October 22nd, 1991. Doug Plude made that 911 call you heard at the beginning of this video. He claims that he woke up and found his wife Janelle leaned over face first in the toilet and she wasn't moving. Doug is an experienced EMT, and so when the ambulance arrived, they walked into the house and they found him trying to do CPR on her, but it was to no avail. Unfortunately, Janelle would be pronounced dead at the scene. Doug tried to insinuate that he believes that Janelle likely ended her own life, and she may have done that by overdosing. The wastebasket in the bathroom had a whole bunch of these opened up pills, which were Fioraset codeine. The coroner would determine that she did in fact have a very large amount of that substance in her system. So she was poisoned either by her or maybe by somebody else. They did find water in Janelle's lungs and there was some like burning in her esophagus. And so they determined that she was drowned, but the official ruling was drug intoxication abetted by drowning. The problem, though, is that there really wasn't much water in their toilet. Certainly not enough for a person to drown in. Janelle's fingerprints were not found anywhere on the toilet itself. However, her palm prints were found on the ground next to the toilet. And then on the countertop next to the toilet, they found another palm print. This palm print belonged to Doug. And he basically said, well, that's where he was standing when he was trying to, like, you know, move his wife. The other issue with Doug's story is that the Fioraset pills, only one of them had Janelle's fingerprints on them. But every single one of those pills was popped open so that the inner, you know, the actual powder could be put into like a drink or something. And if Janelle did that herself, how come her fingerprints were only found on one pill? There was also a whole bunch of paper towels or toilet paper or something in the trash can with those pills kind of wrapped up inside. So what they think is that someone opened up those pills while using a napkin or towel to hide their own fingerprints. They also ran some actual tests with uh, live subjects, seeing if it was possible for someone of Janelle's size to actually submerge her head in the water of the toilet and drown. They showed that it was absolutely impossible. Meaning she could not have overdosed on these pills, gotten her way to the bathroom, and stumbled into the toilet and just fell in there and drowned. She had to have her head forced all the way in. 
What was more evident by that is she had this uh, mark around her throat, including this little fresh ridged cut there. Well, the toilet bowl is perfectly smooth. Her family would say, well, she was missing the necklace. She always wore this necklace, but suddenly it's gone and it wasn't with her. Well, they would determine that that necklace is the exact thing that left those marks, meaning she was pressed into that toilet, which was so deep that it caused the necklace to leave a scar on her. They then find out that Janelle was planning on leaving Doug and it was for possibly another woman. She had been having these internet conversations through a chat room with a woman in a different state. She was planning on visiting this woman. And while Doug can't have that, he can't be embarrassed in this little small town they lived in with his wife leaving him for a woman. So they thought that was motive. So Doug Plude was arrested and he was charged with the murder of his wife, Janelle. He was the only person who could have done it. And they proved it was impossible for her to have accidentally fallen into that toilet and drowned. They believe that he initially poisoned her with a whole bunch of capsules that he probably poured the Fioriset uh, powder into a drink and gave it to her. And that he was expecting her to just die in her sleep. Well, they think that's not what happened. She actually woke up, felt very sick, crawled to the bathroom to throw up, and he's like, well, shit, she's not dead. And so he then decided to act quickly and forced her head into the water and drown her. Doug Plude was found guilty of her murder and he was sentenced to life in prison. But in 2009, I believe, his conviction was overturned by the Supreme Court in Wisconsin due to a witness from his trial lying about their credentials. So a new trial was scheduled, but before that new trial started, he would actually end up admitting to killing her and he pled guilty to her murder. He would end up pleading guilty to a lesser charge, first degree reckless homicide. And he was sentenced to 25 years in prison with the possibility of parole. And in 2020, Doug Plude was released from prison. I have gone away to walk aboard an alien spaceship. Okay. Hello, true crimeers. This is the strange disappearance of Granger Taylor. Viewer discretion is advised. Granger Taylor was a 32-year-old mechanic, and he lived here in Duncan, British Columbia in Canada. Granger was considered by many to be kind of eccentric. In particular, he seemed to be obsessed with aliens and UFOs, to a point where he actually built himself a replica UFO. He told people that he was in communication with aliens. Granger was considered a very intelligent person. He was actually considered to be a genius. He actually rebuilt an old World War II plane. So while many people looked at him as this really intelligent guy, there was also this kind of bizarre side to him. You know, was anyone really supposed to take him seriously when he's talking about communicating with aliens? I was reading that he did like experiment a lot with drugs. In particular, I guess he did a lot of acid, especially in the months leading up to what eventually would happen. It was November 29th, 1980. It was actually a really, really stormy night. Granger had been at, I guess, a local diner there, and he was last seen leaving it sometime around 6.30 p.m. And then he was never seen again. The next morning, his parents woke up and they found a note taped to their bedroom door. The note reads, Dear Mother and Father, I have gone away to walk aboard an alien spaceship as reoccurring dreams assured a 42-month interstellar voyage to explore the vast universe, then return. I am leaving behind all of my possessions to you as I will no longer will require the use of any. Please use the instructions in my will as a guide to help. Love, Granger. Now in his will, he actually made a couple changes. He changed the word death to the word departure. And he deleted from the will any mention of the word funeral. They would report him missing, but they had no luck finding him anywhere. He has never been seen again. Even after that 42 month period where he said he would be going on this space travel thing, he never came back. Not one single report of a sighting of him has ever come in. There's been no tips, no leads. He's just gone, except. So he disappears in 1980. Six years later, 1986, in a wooded area near Mount Provo, uh, which is kind of close to where the Taylor house was, they found the completely destroyed and burnt out remains of a truck. Now, 
Granger's truck that he drove was also missing when he disappeared. It appeared the vehicle had been completely blown apart, possibly with dynamite. Dynamite was missing from the Taylor property. I guess for some reason they had some there. They did find some like identification numbers on the wreckage and they were able to link it to the missing Dotson pickup truck that Granger drove. So that was his truck. Now, reportedly, they also found a couple bone fragments and a little ripped off piece of a shirt that I guess they would somehow say was a shirt that Granger owned, even with just that little tiny piece of it. When the pathologists got those bones, they just basically said, yeah, they're, they're Granger's bones. But DNA testing was not really a thing at that point. And from what I understand, in the years since, they've lost those bones. They're now gone. They're missing. So they've never been able to confirm that those tiny bone fragments actually were Granger's. Over the years, a couple of his friends would say that there is this belief that possibly he was kidnapped by the U.S. government to work at Area 51. Maybe he was actually abducted by aliens. But some of his friends and family say this is done, it's over with. They found his truck and they found his bone fragments. It's gotta be him, we're moving on. And so ultimately, what happened to Granger Taylor? What did he do that day that he disappeared? Did he blow himself up? Was that scene staged to look like he did? Was he taken by aliens? The creepy truth of the matter is, is we will probably never know what really happened to Granger Taylor. Yeah, I think I'm glad this shit funny. You think I'm joking? Like, I'm so f serious. Like, I wouldn't want to, but I will hurt you, girl. I will literally end your existence. And everybody you love, everybody will go about you, like... You think I'm joking? Like, you the LMFAO? No, I'm not kidding. Hello, true crimers. This is the case of Haley Cheney. Viewer discretion is advised. Haley Cheney was born on May 7th, 1999, and she was born and raised in Texas. She was one of four total sisters in the family. And I believe at the time of this case, Haley is working for the Crayola Experience. But her dream was to eventually go to college to pursue a career in forensic pathology. Haley was an incredibly intelligent, very bright young woman. Her family would describe her as a rare breed. Someone that was just super wise beyond her years. She was also a very loving mother. She had given birth to her son just six months before this case occurred. Her baby boy was her entire life. He was everything to her. And she was a fantastic mother. But all of that would end in December of 2023. So this case happened here in Little Elm, Texas. On December 3rd, 2023, Haley had gone to her boyfriend's house, which I guess is where his family lived. And from what I understand, he is the father of her baby. Um, and she goes there with, she brings the baby along with her. I don't know the full context of the voicemail and in terms of like who it was sent to, but the source of this voicemail is directly from one of Haley's family members. And it occurred the night this case happened. So at the boyfriend's house, some kind of argument, some kind of altercation took place. And it sounds like Haley was telling the hit her boyfriend's family, give me back my son, and they weren't giving him back to her. Haley's mom then gets a text message directly from Haley's boyfriend that says, your daughter is tripping, she drank too much. The mom responds with, tell her to call me, and then a minute later, she won't answer, I'm about to head that way. Boyfriend responds, she just had way too much to drink. She's about to fall asleep. She's really tripping. Well, I'm in route. I'm on the way to get her. I'm flying. Now she's leaving. Not driving, but she took off walking. She dropped her phone on the way out. She's just sitting in her car. I think she fell asleep. And then I'm about to be there. When Haley's mom arrives, they see Haley's vehicle parked directly in front of the boyfriend's house in very plain view. The door of the driver's side is swung all the way open. When her mom looks in the car, she sees Haley and she is covered in blood. There is a gun sitting on her lap. Haley had been shot, but she was actually still conscious. She was alive still. 
So 911 is called, she's rushed to a hospital, but just a few hours later, sadly, she is pronounced dead. When her mom got there and the basically the boyfriend and his family were kind of just standing at the doorway of the house, just looking casually at the car, not with any concern. The mom asks, you know, the boyfriend and the family, like, did you hear anything? Did you see anything? And they basically were insinuating that they didn't hear or see anything. Now, normally I would show you crime scene photos, stuff like that. However, the police there in Little Elm, Texas, didn't take any. They took not one single photo of this crime scene. As a matter of fact, they ruled her death almost immediately a suicide. They did not do a gunshot residue test on Haley's hands at all. They did not do gunshot residue tests on any other person who was at the house that night, including the boyfriend. They did not test the gun for fingerprints. They did collect the gun and apparently it's stored somewhere, but it's never been run for fingerprints. They did not interview any of the people at the house that night. They did not bring anyone in for questioning. Haley's mom tells the police, hey, I have all these text messages I can give you from the boyfriend. They said, no, that's okay, we don't need them. The family also has a video that was taken, I think, from her boyfriend. This was obviously sometime prior to the incident where he literally threatens her, threatens her life. Yeah, I don't you guys think shit funny. You think I'm joking like I'm so serious, like... I wouldn't want to, but I will hurt you, girl. I will literally end your existence. Everybody you love, everybody will go about you. Like, you think I'm joking? Like, you think the LMFAO? No, I'm not kidding. The police had no interest in that voicemail at all. The family has also requested if they could get copy of the footage from a uh, camera that they had outside that house. This camera here, which is outside the doorway, which could see where her car was. So they submitted the request and then they're basically denied, uh, essentially saying mm, we're not, no. Because police never actually requested footage from that camera because they didn't investigate this case at all. The sheriff's department or police there in Little Elm did absolutely nothing. They just said, this is a suicide, it's done. They said for a fact, they know for a fact that this was not a foul play scenario. Well, how do you know that if you didn't investigate it? If you didn't question or interview anyone, you can't possibly know that. And not even doing a gunshot residue test on her, at least? How can you know she was the one to pull the trigger? So the family is really just at this point demanding justice be done, even just the bare minimum. They're demanding that the police actually investigate her case. They do have a couple of petitions on like GoFundMe and change.org. I'll try to have those linked in the link tree in my bio. I'll also link below the two TikTok pages that are connected to Haley's case. They just want to know if this for sure was a suicide or if it was a homicide. She loved her baby more than anything, and there's just no way she would just give up like that and just leave him forever. It would be completely out of character. I can't sit here and say that she didn't do it to herself, but for God's sakes, just investigate this. It's not that hard. So hopefully sometime very soon, Haley will get the justice she rightfully deserves. Hello, true crimeers. This is the unsolved murder of Jacqueline Tendall. Viewer discretion is advised. Jacqueline was born on August 11th, 1933 in Illinois, and it sounds like Illinois is where she lived most of her life. Unfortunately, this case has very limited information. This case occurred in the Chicago suburb of Orland Park, Illinois, and it was at the Orland Square Shopping Center. It was December 10th, 1988. Jacqueline and her granddaughter got in their car and drove to the shopping mall to do some Christmas shopping. At some point when they were shopping, Jacqueline realized she didn't have her keys on her and that she locked her keys in her car. So Jacqueline flags down a security guard and asks if he could assist her in getting her keys out of her car. So then the three of them, Jacqueline, her granddaughter, and the security guard, they leave the mall and they begin to walk towards the parking area. At 3.14 p.m., Jacqueline had been walking, I guess, off of the curb and she was the farthest off the curb of the three of them. When all of a sudden, a car driving at a very, very high speed just drove directly into Jacqueline. Jacqueline was, she was struck and then she landed on the roof of the car and then landed on the pavement below. 
The car, which was described as something similar to this, did not stop even for a moment. It actually just continued to speed by. The vehicle was described as a full-sized, two-door, light blue, luxury-style car. Possibly a Buick Electra or a Park Avenue. And the year of those vehicles would have been somewhere between 85 and 87. This is based off of paint fragments they got off of Jacqueline and evidence from the scene itself. Jacqueline was rushed to the hospital where she was put on life support, where she was alive for about two or three days. But unfortunately, she would end up dying from her injuries. Jacqueline essentially was murdered. This was a hit and run, and whoever did it just cowardly drove away. The exact vehicle has never been identified. A suspect has never been identified. I think this was before a time when they had CCTV cameras outside of malls and everywhere you go. So there really was no video evidence and there really wasn't any physical evidence. Just eyewitness testimony and some paint fragments. Her family would accuse the police of not being very thorough in the investigation. The police never went to any automotive shops to see if any vehicles matching those descriptions came in with any kind of damage, because there would have been damage. And it didn't really sound like even the public knew to look out for a vehicle like that. But it's possible that someone somewhere out there knows the truth about who did this to Jacqueline. She deserves her justice. If you have any information, please call 708-349-4111. Just moments after this photo was taken, over 500 people would be dead. This is another worst freak accident. Viewer discretion is advised. This story occurred to Japan Airlines Flight 123. It was August 12, 1985. Flight 123 was completely booked. It had 524 people on board, 509 passengers and 15 crew. And it was being piloted by these three individuals here. The flight took off successfully at 6.12 p.m., and then it got to an altitude of about 24,000 feet, and at that point, everything was still going okay. But then, at 6.24 p.m., a very loud bang came from towards the back of the plane. There, I guess, was a failure of the pressure bulkhead, which caused an immediate and explosive decompression, and air had begun to rush out of the plane. This is a photo taken by a witness who just so happened to see the plane above them. And later on, when people saw the photo, they realized the tail fin was missing. It had broken completely off. This is a photo taken from inside the plane just moments after the plane decompressed. The pilots were trying to figure out how they could do an emergency landing. They were radioing in, they were doing distress calls. They were then given approval to land in Tokyo. At 6.28 p.m., Tokyo was radioing back to the pilots, hey, what's going on? Because the air traffic control had noticed that the plane started to go in a completely different direction. Well, one of the pilots was like, we can't, there's nothing we can do. The plane is now uncontrollable. And I guess it was moving in something called the fugoid motion. It sounds like it makes the plane, like, goes up, but then it stalls and it goes down. And it's like this constant, like, weird movement. Now, they managed to keep the plane up for actually quite some time. They were trying to get the plane so they could land in Tokyo or just anywhere. But then, disaster. Because of the uncontrolled nature of this, they had been flying close to Mount Takamagahara, and one of the wings clipped a ridge of these mountains. This happened at 6.56 p.m., and as the pilot struggled to keep the plane up, it then flew head-on into another ridge and it exploded, killing 520 people instantly. It took them hours to even find the crash site. This is actually the first image they had of discovering the crash site, but it was, it was an absolute nightmare. The plane was in just thousands of pieces. Bodies were everywhere, and it was at that time one of the, or the deadliest aviation accident in history. Unbelievably, despite this, despite the plane being just completely decimated, there were four survivors, all of them women. They were found amongst the wreckage and they were rushed to the hospital and they would actually end up living. So what was the cause? How did this happen? Well, back on June 2nd, 1978, this particular plane was involved in a, an incident at the Osaka airport. When it was landing, the tail of the plane basically scraped along the runway. 
and the aft pressure bulkhead was severely damaged. So Boeing comes out to fix it, to repair this. Then fast forward seven years later, after the repair was done and the crash happens. So I guess they were required to do two rows of rivets, I guess to be installed for a, a splice plate. I'm not 100% sure what any the, the lingo means. So, but they were required to do two rows of those rivets. However, Boeing only did one row, which increased the odds of metal fatigue by 70%. Meaning that because Boeing half-assed the job and repaired it badly, it would cause, while this flight was in air on that fateful day in 1985, which caused the tail to break off, which then led to the pressure bulkhead incident, which then caused the explosive decompression. And at a point, the back of the plane completely ripped off, like moments before the plane crashed. When you see this image, it's extremely haunting to know that 500 people, over 500 people, like what could they have possibly, what was going through their minds, you know? Like you see them all here alive. Nobody appears to be in any kind of panic. And then 30 some odd minutes later, they're all dead. There were no criminal charges ever placed against Boeing for this. However, the families of the victims obviously sued and Boeing did end up paying a lofty amount of money, I guess, to the families. I don't know how much though. But you know what? They would be alive had the person repairing the plane actually done their job. That person should be in prison. One hundred and eighty-eight people would die in one of the worst workplace disasters. Viewer discretion is advised. This story occurred at the Cater Toy Factory, which was located in Thailand. This particular factory would manufacture stuffed toys, plastic dolls, and they did work for Disney, for Mattel, and these items would be exported, primarily to the United States. The working conditions in this factory were reportedly pretty bad, and it was clear that they did not really have any kind of safety plan. It was the afternoon of May 10th, 1993. In one of the buildings on the first floor, a very small fire started. This particular part of the factory had a whole bunch of like fabrics, stuffing, plastics, things that would burn very easily. The employees were told that the fire was really small and it was not to be worried about and go back to work. They did not sound off the fire alarm. But because of the materials in this building, they caught fire very quickly and the fire spread rapidly. And very, very quickly, this building was engulfed in flames. It would be learned later that the building, when it was being constructed, was supposed to have emergency exits in certain spots. However, they never installed them. And most of the external doors in this factory were locked, meaning that everyone was trapped inside with this now inferno. You now have hundreds and hundreds of employees fighting to get out of this building somehow, including trying to climb out of the windows in the second and third floors. Some of them jumping, some of them to their death. The building was reinforced with uninsulated steel girders, which quickly became unstable and were destroyed from the fire, which causes the building now to start collapsing on itself. As workers are trying to escape down staircases, the staircases collapse. Countless employees are now buried under rubble and staircases and are also being burned alive, not to mention the smoke inhalation. Now, there were a couple other buildings where the fire alarms were going off eventually, and those employees in those buildings were able to escape. When it was all said and done, 188 people died in this fire, primarily women and teenage girls. 168 of them were pulled from the wreckage of the collapsed building. 20 of them had been pulled from the building as the rescue was happening, but those 20 people died at the hospitals. What's more unbelievable is that the fire and rescue crews weren't even called until 21 minutes after the fire started. They didn't even get there until 40 minutes after the fire started. There was obviously a lot of lawsuits filed. I don't know the results of all of them. I do know that they were fined 520,000 baht, equivalent to about $12,000 US. 188 people died, and that's all they were fined? Yeah, I beg your finest of every pardon. I'm sorry. I'll leave. What the fuck am I doing? This is my page. You get away, creep. 
Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Karen Mitchell. Viewer discretion is advised. Karen Mitchell was born and raised in Whittier, California, but at a young age, her parents got divorced. So her mom would take Karen and Karen's brother to Orange County to live. But when Karen was around 13 years old or so, her mom would have her move in with her aunt and uncle. That's because her mom just wasn't able, she was working a lot of hours and just was not able to focus all of her attention on Karen. And so Karen moved here to Eureka, California with her aunt and uncle. Karen was described as a fun, outgoing, and kind individual. She loved to make her friends laugh. She was an environmentalist. She was vivacious. She was a straight-A student, incredibly intelligent. And she was hoping to graduate high school a year early so that she could start her college career. But sadly, that did not get to happen. It was November 25th, 1997. It was the Thanksgiving break. Karen's aunt owned a shoe store here at the Bayshore Mall, and that day, Karen was helping her at the store. Karen was then observed leaving the mall at 2.45 p.m. because she was going to be heading to her other job, which was at a daycare. Karen's aunt offered to give her a ride to the daycare center, but Karen said, no, that's okay. It's a nice, bright, sunny day outside. It's only a mile away. I'll just walk. So Karen walks out of the mall, and then she is never seen again. Later that evening, Karen's aunt goes to the daycare center to pick Karen up. But when she arrives, uh, basically the staff is leaving the daycare center and Karen is not among them. The aunt asks them, like, where is she? And they said, Karen never showed up. So Karen is reported missing. So once she's reported missing, a police officer would come forward to say that he recalled an incident where he had to slam on his brakes to avoid hitting a car that looked just like this. And the officer said he observed a young girl who later he would say looked a lot like Karen getting into that car. The officer got a look at the guy behind the wheel and this is the composite they made of him. They are never not terrifying. It just never fails. He was described as a man between 60 to 70 years old with light gray or sandy blonde hair. He had a small build and a large nose. It always amazes me what people are able to remember just based off of a quick little interaction. I mean, I remember waking up a couple of hours ago and forgetting where the bathroom was. When this image was distributed, someone said he looked a lot like another person. A man named Robert Durst. A man who would become a convicted murderer. And honestly, the other than the glasses, they look pretty damn similar. Apparently in an interview, Robert Durst would even say it with regards to Karen, yeah, I mean, she looks like one of mine. However, they've never been able to establish any connection to her disappearance and Robert Durst. They have no evidence, they have no proof, they have no witnesses, no physical evidence, because they haven't even found Karen. Between 1993 and 2014, there would be five disappearances of young women, which would now become known as the Humboldt Five. There, I guess there is speculation that the five of them may be connected in some way, but that's also a really large gap of time. Karen has never been heard from again. She has never been seen again. Her social security number has never been used. If alive today, she may look something close to this. But in whatever capacity it may be, her family just wants her back. And if that means laying her to rest, then that's what it means. But they just want her home. Somebody somewhere out there knows the truth about what happened to Karen Mitchell that day in 1997. She left her job at 2.45 p.m. and never made it to her next job. She disappeared in a 25 to 30 minute window of time. Surely somebody knows something. If that person is you, please contact the Eureka Police Department at 707-441-4060. At 9.20 a.m. on March 10, 2000, a father received a phone call that no parent should ever get. The caller said, we have your son. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Kyle McElroy. Viewer discretion is advised. Kyle McElroy was born on March 30th, 1981, and he was born and raised in Texas. He graduated from high school in 1999, and then he started doing work for his father. His dad, Kevin McElroy, owned a very successful manufacturing business there in Texas. Kyle worked the night shifts as a night supervisor there. It's March 10th, 2000 at 9.20 a.m. Kevin receives a phone call from a woman, a woman who calls herself Sarah. She told Kevin, we have your son, and if you want to see him alive again, you will do as we demand. We have kidnapped your son. 
Now, at first, he didn't really believe her. He thought this was some kind of prank. That is until Kyle spoke on the phone. And he said, quote, Daddy, do what they say or they will kill me. That's when Kevin knew that this was real. But Kevin also thought to himself, the voice sounded like it was coming from a tape recorder. But he had to believe that his son was still alive. The caller said to find Kyle's abandoned truck on the side of a road and don't bring any cops with you or else we'll kill Kyle. Well, Kevin contacted police anyway, and police would kind of follow him, but in unmarked cars. They were dressed in plain clothes, one posed as a farmer. So Kevin gets to the truck. He has to break the window to get in. He was actually afraid the car might explode on him because, you know, he doesn't know what these people are capable of. But they find, he finds the note, the demands inside the truck. It said, you have seven hours to come up with $200,000 or we will kill Kyle. Now, the majority of this was actually happening here in Troop, Texas. So Kevin gets back to his office with now FBI agents. And at 6.30 p.m., Sarah calls back. Kevin explains to her, I can only get half of that money because you've given me such a short amount of time. And she says, fine. But Kevin wants to talk to Kyle and she says, he's fine. And then hangs up. Then she calls back and says, you need to go to this specific phone booth where you will get more instructions. Kevin gets there, he finds the instructions, and it tells him to drop the money off at a specific laundromat. And then once you drop the money off at the laundromat, go back to your office. So Kevin drops the money off at the laundromat and goes back. Then Sarah calls back and says, all right, this is where you can find your son. Meanwhile, officers and FBI have staked out the laundromat where the money was left behind. They find these three men going there to collect that money. And so all three of them are apprehended. Turns out one of them was a man named David Rios, I believe the third guy here. He worked for Kevin, and he worked under a false name. Police and FBI were able to trace the phone number some of these calls were coming from, and they confirmed it actually came from a phone that belonged to him. Police soon learned that Sarah was actually a, a sex worker in the area named Desiree Dawn Lingo Perkins, and she was associated with those three men. She was just the one making the phone calls. So while all that's going on, they also have people going to the location where they were told Kyle would be. Kyle was there, but Kyle was no longer alive. He had been tied up and strangled to death. And his time of death was hours and hours before. When his dad heard his voice, it was actually a tape recording of Kyle. He was forced to say that to record it. And then they killed him which is why Kevin was never allowed to talk to Kyle the rest of the day, because he was dead the entire time. So while the three men were apprehended, Desiree managed to escape, and she became a wanted-by-the-FBI fugitive. It took until about 2004 when she was finally found in Mexico. She was brought back to Texas, where she was charged with the kidnapping and murder, and she admitted to doing all of it, and she was sentenced to life in prison. Daniel Rios was convicted and sentenced to life without parole. The other two men, Alfredo Romero, was sentenced to 30 years. And the other guy, Ernesto Valleon, was sentenced to 50 years. And they never spent a dollar of that ransom money. So they kidnapped and murdered this 18-year-old kid for literally nothing. A car crash death was ruled a suicide. But was it? Hello, true crimers. This is the still unsolved mysteries case of Leroy Dreif. Viewer discretion is advised. At the time of this case, Leroy Dreif was 18 years old and he was engaged to this woman here. Her name was Patty. Patty was Hispanic and she had a very large family. The fact that she's Hispanic does come up in this case. And it is... It's, it was observed on a number of occasions that Patty's family wasn't super thrilled with the fact that she was engaged to a white man. But she was going through with the marriage. It was going to happen. On Memorial Day 1968, Patty and her family were throwing a big party and Leroy was there. This, by the way, is in Mead, Colorado. Some point that afternoon, Leroy gets into his car and he leaves the party. There was allegedly some kind of altercation or fight argument that happened between Leroy and Patty's family. Roughly one or so blocks away from her home down this road, Leroy would crash his car into a tree, and when an ambulance arrived, he was pronounced dead. Now, there was some bystanders there, and I think some of them are actually even Patty's family, who 
the ambulance drivers overheard saying that Leroy crashed into the tree on purpose and that he said he was going to kill himself when he left that party. So the paramedics would relay this to the authorities, including the coroner, which then prompted the coroner to not do an autopsy at all. He just immediately ruled it an auto-suicide and said it was done. Leroy, pictured here at a younger age, had a younger sister. She was, I think, 10 or 11 years old when all of this happened. But she, along with their mother and father, believed that this was not a suicide, that this wasn't even an accident. The, her, their mother believed that he was murdered, probably by Patty's family. So Leroy's mom would go to the DA and beg them, please investigate this case, at, just do something. They looked her in the face and said, listen, it, you're a grieving mom, get over it. It's done. It's a suicide where we're, the case is closed. Well, Leroy's sister Vicky grew up and she continued to fight to get justice for her brother. But police still wouldn't do anything. And so she herself goes around that entire neighborhood and begins to talk to people and question people who might still live there that were there back when this all happened. These neighbors would actually confirm to Vicky that there was a very big altercation between Leroy and Patty's family. And then several more people would confirm that there was a big fight. Now, this is obviously many years later, and so Vicky puts out a personal ad seeing if Patty will contact her. And lo and behold, Patty did. Her and Patty had a conversation at a restaurant. Vicky flat out asked Patty, did my brother say he was going to kill himself after he left that party? And Patty said, no. No, he did not. Patty's family lied and made that up. Fast forward to 1993. They were finally able to convince people to exhume Leroy's body. And so another pathologist did the exam. And he determines that this was probably not an auto-suicide. Why did he think that? Gee, it's probably because the fact that Leroy had two knife wounds to his neck. He had one stab wound and one slash across his throat. And so it was moved from auto-suicide to now undetermined. He wasn't able to confirm if it was the knife wounds directly that killed him, or if he got into that accident and that because of the knife wounds and it was the accident that killed him. And they also couldn't really determine, they couldn't say for sure this, that this was murder because they needed more information. What they believe is that there was that argument and Patty walked Leroy to his car just so he could leave and get away from this argument. But after Patty walked away, they think that at least two of Patty's uh, male relatives approached Leroy in his car and then just very quickly stabbed him and slashed his throat. And then Leroy took off in his car to flee this situation. But then that caused him, because of the injuries and the wounds, to crash his car. So this was more than likely a homicide. But they don't have any suspects named. They don't have any persons of interest named. And that's a lot of the fact because the police did not investigate this at all. It took decades later for them to even exhume his body. But there might still be someone out there who knows what happened to him. Maybe the people that did stab him and kill him are gone now. I mean, this was back in 1968, so. But they may have told people who might still be alive. And Leroy's family just, they just want to know the truth. And if someone can be held accountable that still is alive, then they want the person to be held accountable. So if you have any information about the mysterious death of Leroy Dreith, please call 720-652-4222. She was supposed to be at Paramount Pictures doing an audition for the show Married with Children. Instead, she was never seen alive again. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Linda Sobeck. Viewer discretion is advised. At the time of this case, Linda Sobeck was 27 years old and she was actually a Raiderette. She was a cheerleader for the then Los Angeles Raiders. Linda was a very outgoing, very charming young woman. She was gorgeous, and she was well on her way to pursuing this career of, of modeling, but also acting. She was clearly, she was, she was moving up, but sadly her dreams would never get to come true. It was November 16th, 1995. Linda would call her mom earlier that day, and she told her mom that she had a photo shoot later on that afternoon, and that she would talk to her later. Unfortunately, she never got that call back from Linda. Her mother became immediately concerned when she found out that Linda was a no-show for her audition for the show Married with Children on the Paramount Pictures lot in Los Angeles. This is not something she ever, ever would have just missed. And so her mom knew immediately something was wrong. 
so Linda was reported missing by her mother. And because she was a cheerleader for the Los Angeles Raiders, this took off immediately in the media. They were getting hundreds of tips literally on the hour. They had reached out to Linda's ex-boyfriends or any relationships she had. They were able to determine that none of those men had anything to do with whatever may have happened to her. Then on November 21st, police got a phone call from a man who said he had just been to the Angeles National Forest. And when he was there, he found a series of modeling photos in a trash can. And the guy actually was going to keep those photos because he thought the woman was beautiful. But once he saw the news story about Linda, he's like, oh my God, this is her. So he went to police with all the photos he found. The police then go to that location where he said he was. They search the trash can and they find uh, more photos of Linda. They also find a rental agreement for a vehicle. That rental agreement had a name on it. The name of a man named Charles Rathbun. He was a photographer. They discovered that Rathbun had recently rented a Lexus, specifically this vehicle here. He had already returned it to the rental center, so police were able to obtain a warrant to take that vehicle. Now, it had been thoroughly cleaned by the rental company, but despite that, they actually still found drops of blood inside and more blood. And so at that point, they realized something may have happened in this car. So they bring in Charles Rathbun for questioning. He see, at first, he said, I, I didn't have anything to do with anything. But then when they presented him with some of this evidence, he's like, oh, okay, actually, you know what? I did meet Linda for an interview. He said that they met here at this Denny's and she was giving him her photos and he was planning to do a shoot for with this Lexus. But then he tells police that he told Linda that uh, she wasn't right for the job and that she left. He said she drove away. Well, as a matter of fact, her car was still in the parking lot of that Denny's. It never drove away. Then he says, oh, okay, no, I hired her. We went out to the Mojave Desert where I was going to have her uh, drive the do donuts in this Lexus in the desert. And I was going to photograph her. But then she wasn't doing it right. And so I got in the car and as she stood outside, I was going to show her. He says as he was doing that, he then accidentally struck her with the car and accidentally killed her. The problem with his story is that there was absolutely not a single dent, no damage whatsoever to indicate that he hit anyone. Initially, he told police that he agreed to take them to where he buried her, but he led them on a wild goose chase. Eventually, the family pleaded and said, please show us where she is. And so he finally gave in. In a location here at the Angeles Forest, they found her body. Her body was actually still perfectly preserved even after being buried for about nine days. They found tire tracks next to her body, which matched the tire tracks from that Lexus. They thoroughly examined the area just so they wouldn't miss any clues. But it was very evident to the coroner that she was not killed by being struck by a car. Linda, pictured here in a photo shoot from Charles Rathbun's camera, believed to be the day of her killing, she was bruised, she had ligature marks around her ankles, she had been sexually assaulted, and she was strangled to death. So he was arrested and charged with her sexual assault and her murder. Oh. At his trial, his defense team said, uh, well, there was consensual sex, but literally nobody believed that. He was then found guilty of her murder and he was sentenced to life in prison without parole. What was his motive? Sex. She wasn't going to provide it to him, so he took it. Then he killed her. And now he's rotting in a prison cell for the rest of his stupid life. Eesh, that's a 12 head if I've ever seen one. Ugh. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Mary Ann Perez. Viewer discretion is advised. At the time of this case, Mary Ann Perez was a 33 year old mother living in Chalmette, Louisiana. On the night of March 25th, 1976, Mary wanted to go out and have some fun, have a few drinks with some friends. So she asked her oldest daughter if she could watch the younger kids. And then Mary left and went out. She said she would call around 10 or 11 p.m., which, as a matter of fact, she did. And she told her oldest daughter, I'll be home shortly. But shortly never came. At around 1.30 in the morning, the daughter got a phone call from a woman named Dorothy. Said that her mother was having some car troubles, but she would be home soon. But again, soon never came. Mary's brother, uh, Wayne, said that he did not recognize the name Dorothy as anyone that his sister knew or that he knew. He felt something was off. He also was like, well, her car is actually brand new. She had just gotten it and he couldn't imagine it already had car trouble. 
So they found out that Marianne had gone to a, a bar, I guess, on the outskirts of New Orleans. And then once police get involved, they go to the bar and they find, this is a recreation, Mary's car in the parking lot. However, there is no signs of foul play. There's no blood, no broken windows, and the car actually is in perfectly working condition. It did not have any trouble. But where was Mary? Three days later, in Lake Pontchartrain, a woman's purse is found submerged in the water, and someone had weighed it down with a big brick. Turns out that purse was Marianne Perez's. But again, no sign of Mary. And sadly, it just goes cold almost right away. And then, in 1985, police get some new information. The detective working her case was called out to visit an inmate in Kansas. The man wa was gross. The man was named David Courtney. David Courtney is an alleged serial killer who said, who actually basically described one of his victims as someone bearing a very strong resemblance to Marianne Perez. The detective who came from Louisiana to talk to him in Kansas, well, he was told by David Courtney that on that night he had driven up to the bar and he saw a woman coming out. The woman was stumbling around and trying to get into her car. She looked intoxicated. He offers to give her a ride home. But first he had to pick up his wife, which was down the street at work, and then they would bring her back to Chalmette, Louisiana, because they said, well, we're from there too, so we'll just drop you off. In actuality, they ended up bringing Marianne back to their apartment where she was intoxicated and she passed out. David's wife, Donna, she apparently tried to make sexual advances on Marianne as Marianne was sleeping, but Marianne woke up and was like, whoa, what's going on here? So the couple agreed to then take Mary home. Well, that's what they told her. David would relate to this detective that he had already killed a few women and he didn't want to be identified by Marianne. So as Donna drove the car, uh, David Courtney would strangle Marianne in the car, killing her. They then just dumped her body and it was somewhere near the Louisiana-Mississippi border, possibly the Louisiana-Alabama border. He couldn't really recall. Now, all of his other so-called victims, their bodies were found where he said they were. But this being now 10 years after the fact-ish, police went to that location where he said they dumped Mary's body, but it, she wasn't there. David Courtney ends up being convicted of at least one murder, and he is sentenced to life in prison with the possibility of parole. His wife Donna was also convicted of similar crimes. She was released in 1988, and her parole period ended in 1998. And then sometime after that, very soon after she was paroled, she died. Well, it wouldn't be until 2017 when they finally found Mary. Roughly eight months after Mary disappeared, there was a human body found by a couple of hunters. And that was on Old Pascagoula Road in Grand Bay, Alabama, right on the border. In the location-ish as to where David Courtney said they dumped Mary's body. However, with this being 1976, we didn't have the, you know, communication like this that we have now. So they weren't able to link this Jane Doe to this missing woman from another state. They even made uh, recreations of what this woman looked like, but they never got leads from it. And it was actually just by chance that they even found out that that body was Mary's. Because the detectives were working another cold case of another discarded body of a woman. And they thought, oh, maybe that body was connected to this body. But they weren't. However, at that point, everything is digitalized. And there's, you know, you can find cases from other states. And that's how they linked their Jane Doe to Marianne Perez. They then confirmed that her skull had injuries consistent with a car accident. Because she had been in a car accident just before... Her disappearance. The body they found also had some partial dental plates, which Marianne also had. And so by 2017, they're able to get DNA from those remains and they are able to finally confirm that that Jane Doe body was in fact Mary Ann Perez. And she was where, in the general area of where David Courtney said he dumped her body. David Courtney is still in prison for his other murders. At this point, he has yet to be charged with the murder of Marianne Perez. And I'm not sure if charges are ever going to come forward or not. I don't know. It may have taken several decades, but her family finally found her. And were finally able to lay her to rest. 
And let this case be a great example to those of you who maybe have missing loved ones out there. Even a case back in 1976 where technology was not at all a thing, forensics was very new. Even cases like that are now being solved all these decades later. So this is a wonderful example of please don't give up hope. Your loved one can be found and will be found. And hopefully that also means justice can be served. I am always amazed in how something so evil can live in someone so young. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Mary Schisler. Viewer discretion is advised. It was October 21st, 2016, here in this neighborhood in Republic, Missouri. A 16-year-old kid named Tristan Westrip had apparently gotten into an argument with his family that day, and he said, all right, I'm running away. But what he determined was that he wasn't going to have, or his vehicle wasn't going to be able to get to Canada, which is where he wanted to go. So he gets into his car, he drives around, and he finds himself in this neighborhood, and he sees a truck in front of someone's home. He says, I, maybe that's the truck I want. So he pulls into the driveway, and he parks directly behind the truck, and the owner of that house, 80-year-old Mary Schistler, comes out, and she offers to help the young man. She says, I can take you to go get some gas if that's what you want, or here, use my phone to call someone who can help you. She was being nothing but helpful and supportive to this completely strange person she had never seen or met before. She then says to Tristan, well, let me, let's walk down to my neighbor's house and I think he can help you. As they're doing that, Tristan takes out a knife and he stabs Mary in her temple. He then dragged her body uh, over a fence and into a field. He said he thought he saw her twitching, and so he stabbed her a few more times until he knew she was dead. He then goes back to her house, he steals some items, and he tries to set the house on fire, but he fails. He couldn't do it. Then he stole her truck and took off. Now, nobody witnessed the actual stabbing or anything like that, unbelievably. However, later on, a neighbor noticed a car in her driveway area that he had never seen before and suddenly Mary's truck was gone. So he goes to the house and the door is still open. He calls out for Mary, she doesn't respond. He smells what smells like gasoline or some kind of smoke and fire, so he calls 911. Police arrive and they of course don't find Mary in the house, but they do put out a, a be on the lookout for Mary's stolen truck. A couple of hours later, that truck is found and the person driving it, they're pulled over. In that car driving it was 16-year-old Tristan Westrip. He is arrested and he tells them then, I killed an old lady, just very bluntly and matter-of-factly without any care in the world. He then shows police where her body was and they find it. He initially, during his initial arraignments at the age of 17 now, he pleads not guilty to all charges. I don't know why it took so long but it was like a couple of years later when now when he is 22 years old he ends up pleading guilty to the murder he agreed to plead guilty to it uh, if they took first degree murder off the table and so he was convicted of second degree murder for the murder he was sentenced to 80 years in prison with parole possibility after 15 years he also got an additional 10 years for armed criminal action, seven years for tampering with a motor vehicle, and then four years for the attempted arson. All of the sentences will be running concurrently. It's at that time that he actually decided to finally show remorse for his actions, but he still took those actions regardless. Sorry doesn't bring her back. This was an adult decision he made, and it was brutal. I hope he spends all 80 years in prison. He disappeared over a year ago. Police don't seem to care, and his family is still wondering, where is Matthew? Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Matthew Clark McDonald. Viewer discretion is advised. At the time of this case, Matthew pictured there with his family. He was 29 years old. He was a loving brother, a loving son, and a loving father. He had a son himself. His son meant the absolute world to him, and he would do anything for him. One thing he would not do is leave him. But on March 9th, 2023, Matthew just seemed to vanish into thin air. So this occurred in the California, Pennsylvania area. 
I never knew there was a city named California. But on that March 9th, 2023 day, according to his girlfriend, she dropped him off near some cemetery there in California, Pennsylvania. And then she claims she's never seen him again. As a matter of fact, nobody has. There hasn't been a single sighting of Matthew ever since then. Now, according to his sister, who I've been talking to, and this is her TikTok page, you can see that she has videos on her brother. Matthew's girlfriend, along with some of her friends, were, after he disappeared, were making jokes and outlandish claims about Matthew after he disappeared. Like, almost seemed flippant about it. Like, oh well. Allegedly, during an argument that Matthew was having with his girlfriend, his girlfriend, again, allegedly said something along the lines of ending his life, killing him, or something like that. One would think that that's kind of like an obvious starting point into finding him or what happened to him. The police there claim that they have done everything they can, that they have applied for warrants, but nothing ever seems to really get off the ground with this investigation. The reality is that it's his mother and his family. They're the ones with boots on the ground. They're the ones trudging through, you know, forests and bodies of water and going from house to house and looking at alleys and empty homes. They're the ones doing the search. The police, n not at all. Now, from what I understand, according to one news article, Matthew did have a warrant for his arrest around that time for what, I don't know. And there was kind of like that speculation of like, well, maybe he just left town because of that. But his family says there's just, there's just no way he would do that. Because again, Matthew has a son that he is extremely close with, that he loves dearly. He spent every day with his son. This is completely out of character for him to just pick up and leave. You may be wondering, well, can they track him through GPS with his cell phone? They cannot. Matthew, who usually goes everywhere with his cell phone, like most of us, he didn't have his cell phone on him when he suddenly disappeared. It took the family about a month or so to finally find the phone and retrieve it. And it seemed like the phone had been passed around from person to person over that course of that month. And the family believes that there were definitely things deleted from that phone. But unfortunately, police just, again, they're not doing anything. But he is missing. Not one single person has seen him. Even if someone is trying to flee the area or something like that, someone is going to spot them. This is 2024. Everybody has cell phones. There's cameras everywhere. Something happened to him. By the way, there is a Facebook page called Where Is Matthew? If you search his name, Matthew Clark McDonald on Facebook, you'll find it. And you can get a lot more like information there. But somebody out there knows what happened to him. And perhaps that someone is you. You can report your information anonymously. You don't have to say who you are. You just have to say what you know. And if you look to the side here, you'll see some characteristics of him, his tattoos and whatnot. So if you have any information about the whereabouts of Matthew Clark McDonald or what may have happened to him, please call 304 914 02 Two zero. Okay, and what? This is one of the things that bothers me with regards to like people in the true crime community. Like for some people, you have to fit a certain exact mold in order to be cared about if you go missing or get murdered. First of all, I don't know if that's true or not, but in the end, it doesn't matter. You see this guy here? He is somebody's son. He is somebody's brother. He is somebody's nephew, somebody's grandson. He is also somebody's father. And he is currently missing. Nobody has seen him or heard from him in over a year. He is a human being. Because you see, even if this drug dealer thing you're saying is true, you can come back from that. You can right that wrong. You can turn your life around. You could make amends to the people that maybe this caused you to hurt them in some way. Emotionally, of course. Now, obviously, if this was like, say, a Ted Bundy or a Jeffrey Dahmer goes missing, oh well, let them rot. Because, you know, serial killers, you don't come back from that. There's no righting that wrong. But this type of thing, you know, being involved in drugs or being a dealer, there's a whole bunch of room for forgiveness and for coming back from it. But to say this as if it doesn't matter that he's missing, to say that as if he doesn't matter because of the path he has chosen in life at one point. We all make bad decisions. We have all done something wrong. You aren't perfect. I'm not perfect. Matthew's not perfect. Nobody is. We all make mistakes and we have the opportunity to learn from those mistakes and change the path that we're heading down and go down a different path. And he it deserves that opportunity. And all I can hope for his son's sake is that he didn't meet with foul play and that someone didn't end his life. That somehow, someway, he does get to come back. 
but the circumstances around his disappearance are unfortunately very suspicious. There is certainly a foul play odor, if you will, to this. And if that is the case for, let's say, his son, his mom, his sisters, his family, to see people say stuff like, oh, he was a drug dealer, oh well, it, it, it makes you sound like, uh, it's he's just not worth it. And that's just really sad. It is. Unsolved serial killer cases are always the most wild to me. Hello, true crimeers. This is the unsolved case of the Miami Strangler. Viewer discretion is advised. This particular case happened here in Miami, Florida, and it spanned between 1964 and 1970. Just to let you know right away, I, I don't have any photos of most of the victims, which is also just very sad. On August 17th, 1964, 64-year-old Mary McCreevy was found smothered to death in her home. Six months later, a 38-year-old woman named Sylvia Valdez, she left her work around 9 p.m. When she got to her car, it had a flat tire, so she called a parking lot attendant and he helped her replace the tire. According to the parking lot attendant, he walked away from her at 10.30 and then he saw her talking to two Cuban men. The following day, Sylvia Valdez is found dead in her car in the parking lot. She had been strangled and also shot with a 22 caliber weapon. The skirt she was wearing was pulled up over her head. In February of 1966, 44-year-old Bernita Gonzalez, who was last seen alive in a beauty salon, she was found eight weeks later floating in a nearby lake. She had blunt force trauma to her skull, which they determined likely came from a hatchet. Her underwear was stolen. August 16, 1969, 21-year-old Sherevan Dolores Wooten, her body was found on a dirt road between two houses. She had been strangled to death. May 5, 1970, 64-year-old Mary Louise Clark Danford, she was found in her home strangled to death and she was found by her friends who were concerned that they hadn't heard from her in a couple of days. Her underwear was also missing and her sweater was pulled up over her head. June 2nd, 1970. 64-year-old Ruth Bonner was found strangled to death inside of her apartment. She also had blunt force trauma to her head. Her nightgown was pulled up over her head. August 5th, 1970. 84-year-old Maddie Ophelia Harris was found strangled to death in her home. Her nightgown pulled over her head. October 10th, 1970. A deaf woman named Regina Bonanno, who was 48 years old, was found dead inside of her home. She was found with a bra and a scarf tied around her neck, and she was tied to a chair. Her underwear had been shoved down her throat. October 26, 1970. 36-year-old Patrice Finer Newark. She was found bludgeoned to death in the trunk of her own car. Her underwear was stolen. At least nine murders, and he's never been caught. One suspect, a man named Calvin Jones Jr. was considered because he was the parking lot attendant with the first victim and he also knew Patrice Newark, but he was never charged with anything. There's very little published about this case. I wish I knew more. What's a common trope in movies that never happens in real life? This came from Rom Besk on Threads and I love the comments <laughs> on this. I love like movie tropes and movie cliches. Hey, Sally Jones, I know you. Single women shopping at grocery stores that seem to specialize in extra long baguettes and unpackaged produce. Yep. Whenever someone is fired from their job, the next scene is them walking out into the streets with a white office documents box packed with a picture frame, desk lamp, and a potted plant. If I ever leave a job, I leave with just me. Eating Chinese takeout with chopsticks out of the white cardboard container. I use a fork because... Women who jump up onto a man and wrap their legs around his waist on their way to the bedroom. Someone ever does that to me, we're falling over. It's, oh, it's done. People don't just go into a shower and turn the water on while standing under it like a psychopath. <laughs> People getting knocked unconscious from a blow to the head, but not seriously injured. I'm probably dead from that. Of course, everyone hanging up the phone without saying bye. The way gifts are wrapped with the lid wrapped separately from the rest for easy opening in the scene. Nobody wraps gifts like that. I've literally never seen a gift where the lid has been wrapped separately. Also with this one, I really hate in movies and TV shows when someone's given a gift and they're like, oh my God, what is it? Oh, bitch, open it. High school classrooms where everyone looks 27 years old. 
Yeah. CSI tech looking at a blurry image. Enhance. And then magically it's just enhanced. People asking for a drink, getting a drink, and then without even taking one sip, they need to leave right away and leave the drink untouched. People who hear a noise downstairs in the middle of the night and go in investigating without ever turning on a single damn light. That happened on X-Files all the time. Like, they didn't, they, it was, it lives in an alternate universe where lights does, does, doesn't, doesn't exist. Quick, turn on the news. Character points remote at TV. TV instantly displays a newscaster just beginning the one story we're interested in. Or like when characters are watching something on TV, they don't turn the volume down, but then they have a conversation and suddenly the volume is down. Having a conversation in one location, pausing for the car ride, and then continuing at the next location. Like, they're on a 30-minute car drive. They don't talk about this whatsoever. A naked woman alone or with her husband or lover wrapping herself in a sheet when she gets out of bed. Like, what are you being modest for all of a sudden? Also, when you see a couple who was nude in bed, the woman always has the blanket up past her chest, and the guy only has it up to his waist. Who? who what? A career woman giving up everything to be with a man from the country. <laughs> Telling a cab to follow that car. Running after someone at the airport. Nope. Middle class people living in giant Victorian mansions in San Francisco. Where are you getting this money at? I've never known anyone that goes to a Lamont's class when pregnant. Do those even exist in real life? Someone smoking, quickly fanning it out the window, and whoever walks in has no idea any kind of smoking was happening. That is bullshit. The smell is just instagon. Sleeping on shoes on. What the fuck? The detective who never waits for backup. Yep. Aliens or otherworldly powers always choosing the United States to be their destination. Like, seriously. Go somewhere else. We're not, we're not doing well here. Massive family breakfast on school days. There's 45 seconds left in the timer before the bomb goes off. But a couple takes 10 minutes to declare their love and make big confessions, all before figuring out how to diffuse it in the nick of time. <laughs> always choosing the worst times to have a conversation. What are some of your favorites? What's a common trope in movies that never happens in real life? I thought I would read some of y'all's comments because you guys left a lot of good ones. Making a full spread of breakfast at 6 a.m. before school or work. <laughs> it's on the house because someone is just having a rough day. Bitch, where? No, you're paying for that. I don't care if everyone in your family just died. This is a business. There's no time to explain. Are you driving with them in silence to the destination? When they ask, hello, is someone there? expecting the killer just to say, yeah, no, I'm here. How you doing? Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to break into your house. As I'll pick you up at eight, but then does not ask for a phone number, address, no actual plan made, nothing. Literally happens in every freaking movie. Having private conversations literally a few feet away from someone else and then never hear it. I swear to God, this has always angered me. Can I talk to you in private real quick? Walks a full step over. Then they talk in their normal voice. <laughs> they always find a parking spot right in front of their destination. Nah, that's... Every time I go somewhere, it's like, fuck, I gotta park 800 miles away. Why is there so many people here on a Wednesday afternoon? I hate this one. So fight scenes when one person attacks the main character at a time, and the others just in the background, they're like dancing. <laughs> This is, uh, this is one of the, the scene from Kill Bill when it was the bride versus the crazy 88. They were all just like, all right, we'll wait our turn for this lady to chop our heads off or whatever. Or any kind of like war movie where like your main hero is just one on one versus 8,000. Thanks for being polite and waiting for me. Developers or <laughs> hackers typing super fast on their keyboard for two seconds and looking intensely at the screen and saying, done. Or they say, I'm in. Bitch, into what? And then they dramatically hit enter and everything is complete. I've been rewatching 24 and I swear to God, no matter what they're doing, they're always just like typing. Like, hey, can you pull up that footage from that one camera that I passed by? Sure. Clickety click, 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 click. Where's the mouse? What are you typing? It's not what it looks like. I can explain. And then never explaining it as the other person runs off. No one ever using the bathroom unless it's for comedic effects. Again, I'm watching 24, Jack Bauer. The whole season takes place over the course of a 24-hour period. Not, he never uses the bathroom. Not once. He doesn't even eat food or anything. I would have to take potty breaks every hour in between, like, murdering terrorists. Car keys stored in the sun visor. Seriously, who does that? Not only does the disasters happen in the USA, but only in New York City or Los Angeles, never in South Dakota. That's true. You never like hear of like the epicenter of a natural disaster that's going to destroy the country. It never happens in like Des Moines, Iowa. <laughs> because no one would want to save it. Sorry, that was rude.
when the Unaliver suddenly has super strength and speed, but it's just a regular person. Spirit Halloween costumes are not that good. It's, yeah, like, uh, what's his name? Uh, Ghostface in all the Scream movies. You can shoot him, stab him, throw him off of buildings, light him on fire, beat the ever-living shit out of them. Not a scratch. Then they take that mask off. Suddenly, they are, they will get killed by a fly. Driving and looking at the other person the entire time and barely looking at the road. So they're always like this, like, okay, yeah, 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 we're on a freeway, but that's fine. I'll just sit there and look at you the entire time. Or what about this? Driving like this. Like, stop it. Well, you're crashing all over the place. Uh, you're, you, you're driving. It's just like a subtle, uh, maybe a, the occasional subtle move. Not this. Not, oh, it looks like I'm double jerking. In a shootout, the bad people die with a shot to the shoulder, but the good guys get hit three times and don't die. Oh man, I took a bullet to the head. Thank God it missed my vital organ. I grazed that guy's elbow and his head exploded. That's pretty cool. Six month old babies that are supposed to be newborns. Yep. High school dramas where people are doing like three side quests before school. How early are these teenagers waking up? I would just roll out of bed like three seconds before school started and get to school hopefully on time. Someone yelling, let her go! As if the bad guy is just gonna be like, oh, well since you told me to, okay, I'm sorry. Do you like her? Oh shit, my apologies. Get out of here, scamp. Hospitals and morgues always being dark in horror movies. Those two places are never dark. They are usually bright as fuck. I always, like, always wonder that, too, like, when they're doing, like, an autopsy, it's, like, pitch dark with, like, a little, like, a 40-watt light bulb. How are you seeing their innards? Whole Thanksgiving feast. Kids take one bite. Okay, Mom, bye! No, sit down, eat the food. I spent hours making it at, like, 5 a.m. <laughs> one bite of toast, and that's all they need. And, like, throw the rest. Absolutely clean house, like, out of a magazine. No pet hair, nothing out of place. Come on! And, like, all the furniture and everything is always just, like, white. It's always just so, such bright colors. Ex-bank teller here. You'd be surprised what a million dollars actually looks like. You don't need a suitcase. Maybe a sizable purse. Yeah, I can attest that I was a teller at Wells Fargo for a few years. And when I first saw, like, what $100,000 in cash looked like, I was like, that's it? It's just a little, it's just, like, a little stack. It's like, that's it? I thought, like, you, I thought it'd be like having a room full of money, like, like Mr. McDuck or whatever, just diving into the gold coins. Raw dogging pills without water. How in the hell? Seriously, I cannot take a pill without water. But I also love in movies when they, like, they take a pill and they do this, they go, like, <laughs> just a quick little, till I get the pill down. Also, I love the Insta pills, you know, like when someone's, like, going through something, like, okay, oh, I need my pills, quick! And they take a pill and it's like, ah. Uh... What pills are those that work instant, the second they touch your tongue? Oh my god, this video's been going on for five minutes. Okay, well, I'll stop here. Maybe I'll do another one. Okay, great. <laughs> this is a gruesome and bizarre unsolved murder. Hello, true crimers. This is the case of Mariko Yasuo. Viewer discretion is advised. Mariko and her husband, Muraya, they lived in the Nakagawa district of Nagoya, and that is in Japan. They lived in this apartment building. At the time of this case, Mariko was nine months pregnant. So I, I guess the living situation was that it was more kind of like a, a two-story home. And there was Mariko and her husband lived on the upper floor. And they lived in a bedroom that was next to an empty room. And then there was a family on the first floor. It was March 18th, 1988. Mariah had gone to work that morning. He called his wife uh, a little later that morning and she answered, nothing was unusual. A few hours later, he tries calling her back again, but this time she doesn't answer. When he tries one more time, again, no answer. He becomes concerned and so he rushes home. When he enters the second floor of this apartment, it's pitch dark. He doesn't see or hear anything unusual. Then he goes and changes his clothes when he suddenly hears the sound of a baby crying. He then goes out to the living area where he turns on the light and he sees a newborn baby just covered in blood on the ground, still attached with the umbilical cord to his wife. His wife was lying face down. She was nude and her hands were tied behind her back. He immediately calls for an ambulance, and once they arrive, they find something more horrific. Mariko had been sliced open. Her abdomen had been completely cut open. Someone took a knife and surgically removed the baby from her stomach. The baby also had a couple of cuts on him, but he survives. 
Mariko is alive, unbelievably, but unconscious. She is rushed to the hospital where just a few hours later, she is pronounced dead. The coroner will determine that she had been uh, suffocated or strangled by some sort of ligature. There seems to be conflicting reports on about what type of thing was used for that. Some witnesses said that around three o'clock, they saw a man who they did not recognize running from the apartment. Another person who lived there said that they had someone trying to open their door at about 3.20 p.m. When the person inside the house opened the door to see who was jiggling the door handle, there was a man who just asked to the person in the apartment, do you know where Mr. Nakamura lives? But there was no one there with the name Nakamura living in this apartment building. But whoever that man was has never been identified. And also, they don't even know if that man was the same person running from the apartment after 3.30 p.m. And they don't even know if that's the person who was the killer. Suspicion did, of course, fall on the husband. Some witnesses would say that the couple had quarreled uh, over the recent months, but both seemed to be pretty happy and excited for their upcoming, you know, the baby. But police looked into him and they did a very thorough check into where he was at the time this murder would have happened and they cleared him. He was definitely at work. There's no way he could have done it because witnesses had seen Mariko uh, after he had left for work. And so the police have basically stated that it's really come down to this mysterious man who was seen near this building. Was the same man the person who jiggled the door handle and also was seen running from the apartment? But like I said, he was never identified. In Japan, unbelievably, they actually have a statute of limitations on murder. That statute, I believe, is about 15 or 20 years. That time has passed. So whoever murdered Mariko and cut the baby out of her stomach, well, they got away with it. And who did it and, and why? That will probably remain a mystery forever. This is a very mysterious death. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Natalie Jones. Viewer discretion is advised. 27-year-old Natalie Jones was a mother of two living in the state of Georgia. She was someone who absolutely loved her kids more than anything on this planet. She was just described as a really good person, not someone who ever would wish any harm on another person. But on the 4th of July, 2020, something mysterious happened. That night, she attended a 4th of July party with some friends. Natalie had driven to Jackson's Gap, Alabama, which was roughly an hour or so from her home in Georgia to attend that party. She left that party sometime around 10.30 p.m. and she was in perfectly good spirits. She was sober. She would then text her friend sometime after and said, I made it, thanks. And that was the last time anyone heard anything from her. And nobody ever saw Natalie alive again. When she did not show up, back at home like she was supposed to, she was reported missing. And they searched all over for her. And they were also looking for her very vibrant pink Chevy Cavalier. But for a few months there, they were having absolutely no luck. They did ping her cell phone and it pinged off a tower near Franklin, Georgia. But it wasn't like a very specific location. And then three months later on a very well-traveled road, just off the side of it, here down this path, they would discover a bright pink Chevy Cavalier. Inside the vehicle was a decomposed human body, which they would then later confirm was the body of Natalie Jones. They did a toxicology report. They did a very thorough examination of her body. First and foremost, they said that she had been dead the entire time. So she was in that car dead from the day she was reported missing. And based on how they found the car, it was very evident that the car was also there that entire time. How nobody saw it though, how nobody ever came across it, that seems to be a baffling part of this. But according to the toxicology report, there was nothing abnormal in her system. They also found no traumatic injuries to her body. They have not been able to determine how she died but there were no like drugs in her system, but also like no gunshot wounds, no stab wounds, no blood anywhere found in the car. They don't know how she died. It's evident that she didn't do anything to herself. So how did she get there? It, it's really baffling to police. They just don't know. They can't necessarily rule her case a homicide because they don't have any physical evidence of that. They interviewed people at the party she had attended and they've gotten nothing from that either. 
They haven't named any suspects, any persons of interest. They don't know what a motive would have been. The whole thing is just incredibly strange. But there might be people out there who know what happened to Natalie. There might be people out there who know how she died. And maybe you're afraid to come forward. But her family deserves answers. And if justice needs to happen, you need to come forward to help that justice move on. She has two children that no longer have a mother. And if not for anyone else, you got to do it for them. Someone somewhere out there has got to know the truth. And perhaps that someone is you. You can always report your information anonymously. You don't have to say who you are. You just have to say what you know. If you have any information about the mysterious death of Natalie Jones, please call 706-675-3329. <laughs> he did it. This is the guy. Got him. God, he looks like a Wish.com version of a Muppet. I don't know. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Paul Gruber. Viewer discretion is advised. Paul Gruber was born in December of 1941, and I know that he had at least one child. Paul would go on to spend about 20 years as a teacher, and then he retired early. Paul would retire and move to Sandpoint, Idaho, and he lived right off of Muskrat Lake, this beautiful scenic area, and he absolutely loved it. Not only was Paul a wonderful father, but he was a fantastic grandfather. He absolutely adored his grandchildren. And every year he would send his grandson a birthday card. In January of 1994, Paul's daughter would receive this exact birthday card for her son. And she noticed something a little different with the signature. Something just didn't look right, as well as the handwriting of what he wrote over here. So his daughter takes other birthday cards that he had sent and compared them, and she realized that the handwriting was different. So his daughter Shelly decides to call her dad at his home, but he never picks up. But there is a voice message on the answering machine that Shelly said that doesn't sound like my dad. So after a few weeks, she officially reports her dad is missing and the local police go to his home. They're able to gain entry and it's, it's kind of unusual because while there are still items in the house, they, it's also missing a lot of stuff as if someone had just moved out or was like in the middle of moving. The closets were empty, there was no clothing. It was missing all of the TVs, the radio, stereos, all gone. His car was also missing. But the house had no signs of a break-in. No broken windows, no cut screens, no doors kicked in. There's no signs of a struggle inside the home. And so Paul, seen here in his younger days, he seemed like a really fun guy. His bank accounts had some recent very large transactions. Specifically, $22,000 worth of cash had been withdrawn from his bank account from ATMs over the past couple of weeks. They're able to pull up a uh, camera footage of one of those ATMs during those transactions and they get this guy. That doesn't look like Paul Gruber at all, but some people did recognize the image. Locals said it looks like a man, a handyman named Daryl Kuehl. And they put like his silhouette of the ATM footage next to him and it was him, it was him, definitely. So they find him and he comes in willingly to talk to police. They show him a photo of Paul Gruber, and he says, I have no idea who that is. He said the Paul Gruber he knew and did work for was not the photo they showed him. And so he was making it sound like he was dealing with an imposter Paul, perhaps the imposter who's the one sending these birthday cards with different signatures. He helped police come up with a composite drawing of the man he talked to. <laughs> and so this is the composite drawing of the man that Daryl Kuehl said he had thought was Paul Gruber. He looks like an NPC from like a Grand Theft Auto game. But they distributed this image, nobody recognized him. They go back to Paul's house, the police do, and they begin to do a more thorough search. They notice there is a piece of carpet that had recently been glued down to hardwood. They lift up that carpet and underneath it, they find this little section and part of it had this little gouge in it and it looked like it came from a bullet. They also sprayed that area with luminol and it lit up. They were able to actually get DNA from blood that was left behind here and it matched Paul Gruber. They also tested this mark and it tested positive for gunshot residue. Police were beginning to suspect that Daryl Kuehl was not being truthful. They found out that he was suddenly making very large deposits into several companies that he owned, which all equaled about $22,000. He then tells police, okay, Paul Gruber had actually gone to Canada 
and he asked if Daryl Kuehl would just stay at his house and pay his bills. Because Daryl Kuehl was also picking up his uh, mail, Paul Gruber's mail. They then compared Daryl Kuehl's known handwriting to Paul Gruber's uh, handwriting, and it wasn't a match. However, Daryl Kuehl's handwriting had in fact matched the recent birthday cards that Paul's daughter received, meaning they had been written by Daryl Kuehl. They also had DNA from the postage stamp that was used to send that birthday card. That DNA matched Daryl Kuehl. So then they were able to get a warrant to search Daryl Kuehl's home. And in the basement area, they noticed a recently dug area. So they dug through it meticulously where they found an air mattress that had been wrapped around a human body, soon confirmed to be the body of Paul Gruber. He had been shot four times. The search of Daryl Kuehl's home also found several stolen items, items that belonged to Paul Gruber. They also found his stolen car in possession of Daryl Kuehl. So Daryl Kuehl is arrested and charged with the murder, robbery, etc. At one point, he actually tried to hire an inmate who was recently getting out of prison to kill the transporting officer who would be bringing Daryl Kuehl to, I guess, the courthouse or to jail or something. The inmate ratted him out. <laughs> This was his attempt to try to escape, but it failed, it didn't work. So he goes on trial and he is found guilty of the murder of Paul Gruber. He's found guilty of all charges. And he was sentenced to life in prison without parole. And this guy was not even real. He saved his family from a fire that sadly he would die in. The true crimeers, this is the case of Ryan Ferris. Viewer discretion is it. At the time of this case, Ryan Ferris, pictured here with his mom, was just 14 years old. Ryan was a very active young man, he loved to play sports, and he was also someone who was very, very devoted to his faith. As a matter of fact, Ryan actually aspired to become a priest, if not that, a dentist. Ryan was a really good, very loving brother, an amazing son, he had a lot of friends, and he was definitely a very selfless person. He always wanted to make sure he was helping others, which is exactly what he was doing on this particular night. It was November 6, 1998, here in their home in Lenny, Pennsylvania. Ryan's father, who worked overnights, had already gone to work. He, his mom, and his two siblings had gone to bed. When, according to his mom, he woke her up in the middle of the night and said, Mom, the house is on fire. We need to get out. He said the house was exploding. She couldn't go downstairs, he told her, because there was a giant wall of fire down there. He got his sister and his mom and basically told them to get out of the, of the window from the second floor. It was their only way out. Then he told his mom, I need to go back upstairs to the attic because my brother's still up there. So he ran up to go get his brother. His sister would end up jumping out of the second floor window. His mom began to climb out of it, but she hung on to it, waiting for her two boys to come out. She said she saw her oldest son, and he jumped out of the window. And she was hanging there still, screaming for Ryan, 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 come on, please. But she eventually had to let go, and she fell to the ground. And she injured her spine. When firefighters arrived, they tried to get the fire out. And according to the firefighters, they could hear Ryan saying the Hail Mary in a very panicked and very frightened way. Ryan was caught in a wall of fire. They couldn't get to him. Ryan Ferris, a 14-year-old child, burned alive and died also of smoke inhalation, but not before making sure his entire family was out of that house. The fire investigators were determined that there was nothing that happened in the house that was like natural fault to your wiring or anything like that, none of that caused the fire. In fact, they determined the fire was started deliberately on the exterior of the house on the first floor. Somebody set their house on fire. Somebody deliberately targeted that house to light up. And in the process, intending to probably kill anyone in it, they killed a young boy. However, they have never found out who did it. They don't have the forensic evidence to point to anyone. They don't have witnesses. They've had tips and leads, but they've never led to anything. And so they're asking for your help. If you have information, please call 610-497-2633. Hello, True Crimeers. This is the case of Sarah and Buddy. Viewer discretion is advised. Unfortunately, I don't really have a lot of information to provide on this one. 
At the time of this case, Sarah York was 21 years old, and she was dating 23-year-old Buddy Bolding. They lived in the Pawnee County area of Oklahoma. The couple was described as being very, very much in love, and the two of them had just recently moved into a new home together. It was October 16th, 1999, when Sarah's 18-year-old sister had gone to their new home. When the sister entered the home, she found something horrific. She first found her sister Sarah had been shot to death. So she immediately contacts police, and when police arrive, they confirm that Sarah is deceased in the home, and then going further into the house, they also find the body of Buddy. He had also been shot to death. They were able to quickly rule out this being some kind of murder-suicide. They were found in two different places, and the gun was not located near any of their bodies. As a matter of fact, from what I understand, the gun wasn't even found in the first walkthrough of the home. It was found on a second walkthrough in a closet, and it was completely wiped of prints. But they were able to pretty much state that this was in fact a double homicide. And the gun itself was actually one that was owned by Buddy. It was his gun he was shot with. There was no force entry to the house. Sarah's purse was in the home and it had been dumped out, um, but I'm not sure if anything was actually stolen or if they know if anything was stolen. There was speculation that Buddy may have been involved at the time in dealing marijuana and that possibly, maybe that could have been a motive for this to happen. But that's just speculation. They don't actually have proof of that. They don't know if the killer was invited into the home or if they somehow weaseled their way into the house, or maybe the door was already unlocked and they just walked in. It all seems to be pretty unclear. There's really nothing published about this case. There's very, very few articles about it. And so, you know, hopefully this story, their story can get out and perhaps it can help lead to capturing who did this because somebody somewhere out there has to know. And the person who did this, this was only in 1999, it's only been, you know, 25 plus years, that person could still very much be alive and out there somewhere. And they should be locked up if they aren't already. And these two deserve their justice. If you have any information about the murders of Sarah York and Buddy Bolding, please call the OSBI at 405-848-6724. You can report your information anonymously. You don't have to say who you are. You just need to say what you know. Please help Sarah and Buddy get the justice they rightfully deserve. Oh, okay. Uh, it's giving Stephen McDaniel, kinda. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Scott Rossiter. Viewer discretion is advised. Scott Rossiter was a 30-year-old father of two, and he became a police officer in Canada in 1990. Scott was well-liked, he was well-respected, and he was someone who upheld the law. Unfortunately, though, he was not an officer for very long. So this case happened here, and hopefully I say this right, in Ingersoll, which is in Ontario in Canada. And it was September 19th, 1991. Scott was working a night shift, and he was patrolling kind of an area around Ingersoll. At 11.05 p.m., an altercation began between him and a man who was riding a bicycle in the area he was patrolling. I'm not entirely sure what that initial altercation was about. I just know that he was questioning, according to what he radioed in, questioning this man on the bike. The man he was questioning managed to grab his gun off of him and he fired uh, several shots at him. Scott had been shot through the back of his head. He was rushed to the hospital, but unfortunately, about an hour and a half later, he was pronounced dead. Scott's gun was missing from the scene, so it was obvious that his killer took it. They were able to determine fairly quickly that the one responsible for this was this man here, 33-year-old David O'Neill. I don't know if it's just like the lighting or the quality, but that it's just, he looks frightening. He was a local motorcycle repairman. So they basically put out uh, an all-points bulletin to find this guy, and they had absolutely no luck. On January 13th, 1992, approximately 50 miles away from where the murder of Scott Rossiter took place, a human body was found, and it was badly decomposed. Using dental records, they were able to confirm that the man in this grave was, in fact, David O'Neill. He had been shot several times, and he was found in a shallow grave, meaning he himself was murdered. 
David O'Neill did associate with local bikers, and police there in Canada began to suspect that possibly David O'Neill was killed by some biker gang to prevent him from, I guess, putting any scrutiny on their group. This alleged group, or possibly several different groups, I'm not sure if they've ever narrowed it down, they are known, or were known back then, of having committed criminal acts before. So if David O'Neill was associated with them, they didn't want the police to say, well, that they were responsible for the murder of a police officer. So there is that speculation that David O'Neill was murdered by that group to prevent anything coming on them. I don't know if they ever expected him to be found, though, but he was. Was David O'Neill definitely the killer here? I don't think they can say that for absolute certainty. They never found the gun. But based on, I guess, what they investigated, they do believe he was the one to do this. And it only furthers that evidence that he himself had been killed. So if David O'Neill was the killer, then Scott Rossiter, in a different kind of way, got the justice he very rightfully deserved. Me and my buddy go over there and see if we can find the truck. He walks off one side of the road. That was at 10 o'clock this morning. I walked off the other side of the road. And he's been gone ever since. I ain't been there find him. I've been everywhere looking for him. Nah, he's just, I can't find him. Hello, True Crimerers. This is the strange disappearance of Skylar Burnley. Viewer discretion is advised. At the time of this case, Skylar Burnley was a 27-year-old living in the Brandon, Mississippi area. Everybody describes Skylar, who would also go by just Sky, as just a solid good guy. He was someone with manners. He would always say please and thank you. He would open doors for people. And he would just make everyone happy. Skylar did have a recent run-in with the drug scene, which even put him in jail for a, a short amount of time. But by the time this case happens, he is already well on his way to correcting that. He was working very hard to turn his life completely around. And he absolutely would have succeeded at that. But then he vanished. Skylar, who was living with his grandma at that time, would actually go to hang out with his friend or acquaintance, Travis, and this was on June 2nd, 2016. Later that night on June 2nd, he would call his grandma to say, hey, I'm going to be spending the night over at Travis's house. But after that, nobody from his family had heard from him ever again. Then this 911 call comes into police. Me and my buddy go over there and see if we can find the truck. He walks off one side of the road, that was at 10 o'clock this morning. I walked off the other side of the road, and he's been gone ever since. I ain't been there to find him. I've been everywhere looking for him. Nah, he's just, I can't find him. That call came from Travis Brewer. So this is now all according to Travis and his uh, common law wife, Amanda. He states that on the morning of June 3rd, 2016, he woke up to find his pickup truck had been stolen from his property. He claims that his cell phone, he left it in that truck that night. So what he says he does is he contacts the cell phone provider and they're able to provide him with a, like a pinged location of where his phone was. And it was somewhere in the middle of these woods. So Travis with his common law wife, Amanda, and their four-year-old daughter, along with Skylar, because Skylar had spent the night, got into another vehicle where they then would drive to the location where the truck was supposed to be. This is footage from a gas station, specifically this one here, that shows Skylar, Travis, and the four-year-old walking towards the entrance. And then more footage of them walking around, picking out a couple snacks, and you can confirm there was the child with them. They then check out and they leave the gas station. Skylar appears to be completely normal. He's coherent, he looks sober, everything seems fine. This is the last known image of Skylar Burnley. So the four of them then get back in the truck and they head out towards the woods where the cell phone pinged, which would be where the truck was, allegedly. Now, eventually, according to Travis, they do find the truck out there and the person who stole it, which was a friend of theirs, was not with it. But before they find the truck, Travis says he goes in one direction, down one path, and then Skylar, for whatever reason, goes down a completely different path, which is strange because... Travis supposedly has the exact pinged location of where the phone is. Why would Skylar go a different direction? And then Amanda and the four-year-old stay back with the car they took to the woods. When Travis gets back to the car, Skylar is missing. He's gone. Travis then says he gets into the vehicle. He brings Amanda and the four-year-old home because it was really hot and the car did not have any AC in it. 
Travis then claims he gets back into his vehicle and drives back out to the woods to see if he could find Skylar. He doesn't. The morning after, one of Skylar's relatives gets this exact note um, left on their door. And it says, Travis, Sky friend, he is missing. I am worried something bad has happened. And then there's a couple phone numbers on it. The note came from Travis. Travis then calls 911 and rambles on forever about the whole situation with his stolen truck. And at the very end of that call, he just tosses in, oh, by the way, my friend Skylar is missing. So police, family, and friends, they go out to the woods and they do an extremely thorough search. Because by every account, Skylar should be out there. They search for a very long time. They do not find a single trace of Skylar. No hints that he was even out there in those woods. And there has been no sighting of Skylar ever since. There is a lot of suspicion around Travis. Travis and Amanda both took lie detector tests. Amanda basically passed hers. Travis did not. It showed he was being deceptive about if he knows where Skylar is. However, no charges have ever been brought against either of them. The four-year-old girl was questioned and it didn't sound like she was able to provide much information. So what happened between this and then them getting out into the woods? That's what the family and police want to know. Was this somehow related to the drug scene? According to Travis and Amanda, they had all been doing meth that particular evening, that June 2nd evening. Could this have been a drug-fueled just thing? Skyler also had relations to the Simon City Royals, a gang, but he had been trying to get out of it. Was this a retaliation thing? Did they contact Travis to say, hey, do our dirty work so that our hands are clean? It's a theory, but nobody really knows. One other thing to point out, and this is extremely suspicious, Travis claimed his cell phone was in the truck and that's how he found the location of the truck. However, when they later searched around the home that Travis and Amanda lived in, they find his cell phone in some bushes. It was never in his truck. So he never actually pinged that location. These two are clearly hiding something. And Skylar is still missing. Missing since 2016. If you have any information about the disappearance of Skylar Burnley, please call the Rankin County Sheriff's Department at 601-825-1480. I love murder. <laughs> like forensic files, right? Like like forensic files, right? No, nah, girl, you're dead. Me has anxiety about being home alone and someone breaking in. Also me records a true crime series about people who are murdered in their homes when they're alone. Why am I like this? <laughs> murder documentaries be like, they were good friends until they weren't. When I start watching Forensic Files and I realize I've already seen the episode, I get mad. I get so mad I could poison someone in small amounts every day for six months. With antifreeze. I love this one. Did Carol Baskin kill her husband? No? Yes. Amazon delivery guy? Boom. <laughs> I feel like people who end up on Dateline for committing a murder don't watch enough Dateline to plan their crimes accordingly. That's true. Idiots. Boomer. There's so much violence today. I'm so glad I grew up in the 70s. The 70s. Do you assume all trash bags on the side of the road are body parts discarded by a serial killer, or are you normal? Actually, I consider you weird if you don't think that. Forensic Files narrator, and he left his fingerprints on the doorknob. Me, while eating my fifth mozzarella stick. You absolute fucking idiot. <laughs> Me, ugh, I need a distraction from the horror of this world. Netflix, well what about this documentary about a gruesome murder? Oh, for fuck's sakes, Netflix. What? That sounds awesome. Put it on. My knowledge of true crime cases. <laughs> My knowledge of actual important shit. <laughs> if you can't see it, she's holding a little teeny tiny purse. When I die, my wife will use the 396,451 hours she spent watching forensic files to solve my murder or to be a, the one who have committed your murder because of all that knowledge. So, oops, watch out. Imagine you get murdered and some girl just skips your episode of forensic files <laughs> because it's boring. I would haunt the shit out of you. When your husband talks to you about increasing the amount of your life insurance policy. Uh, wait a second. Me. Wow, why am I so freaked out all the time? Also me. Watches disappearing shows, listens to murder podcasts, watches unsolved crime videos. We're our own worst enemies. <sighs> Cashier. Would you like a receipt? Me. Hmm, if someone is being murdered right now, it would be my alibi. But if someone gets murdered in the store, they could pin it on me. Cashier. Well, me. 
I want to talk to a lawyer. <laughs> When you're watching a true crime documentary and the host keeps mentioning the murderer's unhealthy fascination with serial killers. <laughs> so I'm watching a serial killer documentary to calm my nerves so I can get some restful sleep. It's complicated. <laughs> that applies to a lot of you guys. Is the dog okay? My main concern while listening to true crime stories that mention the dog, same. It's funny, I can't even mention when a dog dies because it breaks my heart. Conan O'Brien said, true crime podcast idea. The husband didn't do it. It will be two episodes. <laughs> I think I can speak for the whole true crime podcast community when I say, fuck the word r rural. You have no idea how accurate that is. <laughs> Hate that word. If I was a DJ, I would put on the, the Crime Junkies theme song and watch white women go crazy. <laughs> Listen, not everyone has the trunk space or gas money to drive way out in the middle of nowhere to dump their bodies. Check your privilege. We're all doing the best we can out here. I also love this person's response. Uh, my house has no backyard, cellar, or crawl space, and I don't have a car. A career as a serial killer just isn't on the cards for me. <laughs> Thank you, True Crime Show, for saying that was a reenactment. I was pretty upset your camera person didn't stop that murder. Like, seriously, you don't gotta tell us it's a reenactment. We get it. Me, after watching fake horror movies. Terrified. Me, after watching true serial killer documentaries. Fast asleep. Passed out. Again, that's a lot of you, especially you ladies. Me, watching true crime documentaries to catch patterns so I have an escape plan for every scenario. <laughs> yep. Me, after watching a case on unsolved mysteries that had the audacity to be unsolved. Always angry at the end. My favorite thing to do while watching Dateline is to try to figure out if people being interviewed are in jail. Are they talking to Keith Morrison in a TV studio or prison common room? Is that regular eyeliner or melted crayons? T-shirt or Department of Corrections casual wear? I do this, I used to do this all the time with Forensic Files, like when they're interviewing like the husband. I'm like, what's, what's in the background? Uh, is this, is he in prison? Did they have scary movies when you were a kid? We had scary everything when I was a kid. Me, Googling the name of the murderer to see what they look like approximately four seconds after starting a new podcast. Yep, guilty. When someone asks you what you do for fun and you don't know how to tell them, your favorite pastime is watching shows about people being murdered. What is wrong with us? <sighs> Killer in true crime documentary murders 21 people with a weed whacker and films it. His mom, my boy is innocent. He wouldn't hurt a fly. <laughs> um, excuse me? My soulmate is somewhere out there, quarantining in sweats, laying on the floor and dissociating into madness while the 18th hour of Forensic Files plays in the background. I can't wait to find you when the ban is lifted, you sad, cozy, twisted bitch. Ah, love. When you're listening to a true crime podcast in public and the host says, the killer is still walking among us. The fuck? Yeah, I used to think every killer on Unsolved Mysteries was in my house, down the hallway. Saw a shadow, that was it, it was him, I was being murdered that day. Me watching true crime shows and judging the murderer for being an idiot. Like, come on Daniel, have you ever heard of gloves? No shit, really? Imagine just casually posting your running route on Instagram, like the whole ass map, with your true, with your timestamps and everything. You ought to listen to true crime podcasts when it shows. Yeah, stop being overly personal and sharing where exactly you are. People on true crime documentaries, you just never think it's gonna happen to you. Me, a hypochondriac with paranoia and generalized anxiety. Au contraire. Yep, yeah, no, I'm, I'm convinced it's going to happen to me. When you figure out who the killer is before the episode ends, voila! Is that the hot guy from Criminal Minds? How my friends look at me while I'm explaining my theories about every missing person's case ever. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I'm safe from being a murder victim, as the room does not light up when I walk in. Neither am I well-liked by everyone in the village. Yeah, just stop lighting up rooms, for God's sakes. So I was petting a dog, and the owner was like, Do you want to see her puppy? And I was like, Bruh, fuck yeah! So I for real went to this bitch's car with her, and the puppy was cute, but I really followed a stranger to her car because she said she had a puppy. Ted Bundy would have loved my dumbass. Oh, you have a 4.0 GPA? That's cute. I've solved the Jean Benet Ramsey case over 600 times. Not to brag. This is a serial killer you have probably never heard of. Oh god, of course. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of the trash bag killer. Viewer discretion is advised. On May 18th, 1977, the body of John LeMay, who was a 17-year-old who had gone missing a few days prior, his body was found. 
His body was found in several different trash bags. He had been dismembered and they were able to determine that he had been sodomized. Police were able to determine that John LeMay, because thankfully he told several people where he was going, they were able to determine that he went to the house of David Hill, who also lived there with Patrick Kearney. Police go to their home and question them and they were very cooperative. But soon after police left their house, the two of them fled. And once they fled, police immediately considered the two of them suspects in the murder of John LeMay. On July 1st, 1977, the two of them would turn themselves in. 34-year-old David Hill would soon be cleared of any wrongdoings because there was no actual evidence to show that he murdered John LeMay. However, his live-in boyfriend, Patrick Kearney, would confess to killing John LeMay. And it wasn't just him that he killed. Patrick Kearney would confess to the murders of 31 young men and boys, who he had also confessed to sexually abusing their corpses and then dismembering the majority of their bodies and then throwing them in trash bags, which were found in various locations, which is why he would be called the trash bag killer. Some people refer to him also as the freeway killer. All of these murders occurred between 1962 and 1977. The first four victims he confessed to, their names were pretty much unknown. And three of the first victims were never actually found. But he did confess to shooting and killing them and dismembering them and sodomizing them after they were dead. The rest of the victims were 13-year-old John Demchik, 17-year-old James Fletcher Barwick, 5-year-old Ronald Dean Smith Jr., 21-year-old Albert Rivera, 20-year-old Larry Jean Walters, 17-year-old Kenneth Eugene Buchanan, 13-year-old Oliver Peter Molitor, 15-year-old Larry Armendariz, 13-year-old Michael Craig McGee, 23-year-old John Woods, 17-year-old Larry Espy, 20-year-old Wilfred Faraday, 16-year-old Ronald Lawrence Moore, 19-year-old Timothy Brian Ingham, 17-year-old Robert Benefiel, 27-year-old David Allen, 20-year-old Mark Andrew Orock, 28-year-old Nicholas Hernandez Jimenez, 24-year-old Arturo Ramos Marquez, 17-year-old John Otis LeMay, 8-year-old Merle Chance. Those were not even all of the names. There were more victims. Patrick Kearney would say that when he and his live-in boyfriend would get into arguments and fights, he would get into his car and then just drive around the Southern California area. He lived in like Los Angeles. And he said that he would find these young men if they were hitchhiking or maybe he found them at uh, local gay bars and a couple others he just sort of found just kind of walking along the road and abducted them and then would shoot them and then he would sexually violate them after they were dead. He had a relatively normal upbringing. He was considered a very intelligent young man growing up. He was, some people said he was a genius. He didn't really have the, you know, the typical serial killer growing up where his parents physically abused him, alcoholics, that kind of thing. However, he did have a traumatic upbringing himself individually because of, he was very skinny and scrawny and so he was bullied all the time. And then some people think that would lead into this desire to kill people. His live-in boyfriend, David Hill, they discovered was, was really none the wiser to all of these murders. Now, John LeMay had gone to their house because he knew David Hill and was going to visit him. But when he got to the home, David Hill actually wasn't there, but Patrick Kearney was. Patrick invited the 17-year-old in where he promptly shot him and then sodomized him, dismembered him, and threw him away in garbage bags. So Patrick Kearney now has confessed to all of these murders and he pled guilty to all of them in order to avoid the death penalty. He would end up being convicted and sentenced to 21 life sentences. He is at Mule Creek State Prison in California where he is rotting away for the rest of his pathetic, disgusting life.